Today Matters, 12 Daily Practices to Guarantee Tomorrow's Success, written by John Maxwell and read by the author. Hi, this is John Maxwell. A few weeks ago, I was going through a box of old books in the basement looking for something to read to my grandchildren. And I came across a book my wife Margaret and I used to read to my daughter Elizabeth when she was little. It's called Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day by Judith Viorst. It's the story of a little boy whose day falls to pieces. It begins, I went to sleep with gum in my mouth and now there's gum in my hair. And when I got out of bed this morning, I tripped on the skateboard. And I could tell it was going to be a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. From there... Alexander's day just keeps getting worse as he goes to school, finds himself at the dentist's office, and has to go shopping for clothes with his mother. He has a miserable day. Even the family cat seems to be against him. Our kids always liked Viorst's book, and I think we adults had as much fun reading little Alexander's grumpy complaints as they did listening. But it's no fun when your own day feels like Alexander's. Who looks forward to a day filled with obstacles, trials, and setbacks, where each bend in the road seems to hold something worse? When it comes to approaching the day, we often are more like Alexander than we would care to admit. We may not wake up with gum in our hair or feel that our family and friends are out to get us, but our days often fall to pieces, and as a result, they seem like very bad days. How often do you have a great day? Is it the norm or the rare exception for you? If I ask you to rate today on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being perfect, would you even know how to score it? Upon what would you base your rating? Would it depend on how you feel? Would it be determined by how many items you've checked off your to-do list? Would you score your day according to how much time you've spent with someone that you love? How do you define success for today? Everyone wants to have a good day, but not many people know what a good day looks like, much less how to create one. And even fewer people understand how the way you live today impacts your tomorrow. Why is that? The root of the problem is that most people misunderstand success. If we have a faulty view of success, we take a faulty approach to our day. As a result, today falls to pieces. Listen to these common misconceptions concerning success and the responses that often go with them. We believe success is impossible, so we criticize it. Psychiatrist M. Scott Peck opened his best-selling book, The Road Less Traveled, with the words, Life is Difficult. He went on to say, Most do not fully see this truth that life is difficult. Instead, they moan more or less incessantly about the enormity of their problems, their burdens, and their difficulties, as if life were generally easy, as if life should be easy. Because we want to believe life should be easy, we sometimes assume anything that's difficult must be impossible. When success eludes us, we are tempted to throw in the towel and assume it's unattainable. That's when we begin to criticize it. We say, who wants success anyway? And if success is achieved by anyone whom we consider less worthy than ourselves, we really get steamed. Our second misconception is that we believe success is mystical, so we search for it. If success has escaped us, yet we haven't entirely given up on it, then we often see it as a big mystery. We believe that all we have to do to succeed is to find the magic formula, silver bullet, or golden key that will solve all of our problems. The problem is that we want the rewards of success without paying the price. Seth Godin, author of Permission Marketing, recently wrote about this problem in the business world. He believes that business leaders frequently look for quick fixes for their companies. You don't win an Olympic gold medal with a few weeks of intensive training, says Godin. There's no such thing as an overnight opera sensation. Great law firms or design companies don't spring up overnight. Every great company, every great brand, and every great career has been built in exactly the same way, bit by bit, step by step, little by little. Misconception 3. We believe success comes from luck, so we hope for it. 
How many times have you heard people say something like, he was just in the right place at the right time to explain away someone else's success? It's a myth, just like the idea of the overnight success. The chances of becoming a success due to luck are about the same as winning the lottery, 50 million to one. When it comes to success, you're better off hopping to it than hoping for it. Next, we believe success is productivity, so we work for it. I once saw a sign posted in a small business that said, The 57 Rules of Success Number 1. Deliver the goods Number 2. The other 56 don't matter There's something about working hard and producing results that feels very rewarding, and many people regard that feeling so highly that they define it as success. But seeing hard work as success is one-dimensional. A strong work ethic is an admirable trait, but hard work alone doesn't bring success. There are plenty of people who work hard and never see success. Some people give their energy to dead-end jobs. Others work so hard that they neglect important relationships, ruin their health, or burn out. Success may not come to those who don't work hard, but hard work and success are not one and the same. Misconception 5. We believe success comes from an opportunity, so we wait for it. Many of the people who work very hard yet don't seem to get anywhere believe that the only thing they need is a break. Their motto begins with the words, If only. If only my boss would cut me some slack. If only I could get a promotion. If only I had some startup capital. If only my kids would behave then life would be perfect. The truth is that people who do nothing more than wait for an opportunity won't be ready to capitalize on one if it does appear. As basketball legend John Wooden says, when opportunity comes, it's too late to prepare. And for those who receive their wish of a promotion, startup, money, or anything else, it rarely changes anything in the long term if they haven't already done all the groundwork to be successful. Misconception 6. We believe success comes from connections, so we network for it. People who believe in connections think they would have it made if only they would have been born into the right family, or they think their fortunes would suddenly improve if they met the right person. But connections alone will neither improve the life of someone who is off track nor guarantee success. If they did, the children of every successful business person would have it made and the siblings of every U.S. president would be highly successful. But you know that is not true. Remember Billy Carter? Another misconception is that we believe success comes from recognition, so we strive for it. In your profession, is there a sure sign that you've made it? Would your peers be impressed if you were recognized by Fortune magazine, became a chess grand champion, or won the Lombardi Trophy? Or do you picture yourself accepting the Pulitzer Prize, Fields Medal, or Nobel Prize? In France, a nation of food lovers where chefs receive the highest honors, one of the highest marks of recognition anyone can receive is a three-star rating for his restaurant from the Michelin Guide. At present, only 25 restaurants in all of France hold that honor. One of them is an establishment in the Burgundy region owned by Bernard Loiseau called the Cote d'Or. For decades, Chef Loazo was said to be obsessed with creating the perfect restaurant and receiving the highest rating awarded by Michelin. He worked tirelessly. It takes great work to earn even a two-star rating, but Loazo achieved it in 1981. And then he worked harder. He perfected each dish on his menu, he improved the restaurant's service, and he went $5 million in debt to improve and expand his facility, and finally, in 1991, he received his third star. He had accomplished what only a handful of others could. We are selling dreams, he once said. We are merchants of happiness. But the recognition he received didn't keep him happy. In the spring of 2003, after the lunch service, he committed suicide by shooting himself. He didn't warn anyone, nor did he leave a note. Some say he was disconsolate because his rating in another restaurant guide had fallen from 19 to 17 out of 20.
Others described him as manic-depressive. No one will ever know why he killed himself, but we can be sure that the great recognition he had received in his profession wasn't enough for him. Finally, we believe success is an event, so we schedule it. I've dedicated more than 30 years of my life to speaking at events and putting on conferences to help people be more successful and become better leaders. But I'm very realistic about the limited impact an event can make in a person's life, and I frequently remind conference attendees of those limitations. Events are great places for receiving inspiration and encouragement. They often prompt us to make important decisions to change and they can even provide knowledge and tools to get us started. However, real sustainable change doesn't happen in a moment. It's a process. Knowing that has always compelled me to write books and record lessons so that people who have made the decision to change have access to tools they can use after the event to help facilitate the process. We use that process orientation at Equip, the nonprofit organization I founded in 1996, with the goal of training and resourcing one million leaders overseas. We don't simply drop in, put on an event, and disappear. We use a three-year strategy. We begin by translating books and lessons into the local language. After the first teaching event, we give leaders books and tapes to use for their ongoing growth and teams go back to the country every six months to teach more skills and follow up with leaders. Don't get me wrong, events can be very helpful, as long as we understand what they can and cannot do for us. I want to encourage you to attend events that can be catalysts for change in your life. Just don't expect them to suddenly bring you success. Growth comes from making decisions and following through on them. And that's what this book is all about. If we want to do something with our lives, then we must focus on today. That's where tomorrow's success lies. But how do you win today? How do you make today a great day instead of one that falls to pieces? Here's the missing piece. The secret of your success is determined by your daily agenda. When I talk about your daily agenda, I don't mean your to-do list. Nor am I asking you to adopt a particular kind of calendar or computer program to manage your time. I'm focusing on something bigger. I want you to embrace what may be a whole new approach to life. You will never change your life until you change something you do daily. You see, success doesn't just suddenly occur one day in someone's life. For that matter, neither does failure. Each is a process. Every day of your life is merely preparation for the next. What you become is the result of what you do today. In February of 2003, I was privileged to spend some time with one of my idols, John Wooden, UCLA's Hall of Fame basketball coach. One of Wooden's sayings provides the missing piece for how we should handle today. He frequently exhorted his players to make each day their masterpiece. He wrote, When I was teaching basketball, I urged my players to try their hardest to improve on that very day, to make that practice a masterpiece. Too often we get distracted by what is outside our control. You can't do anything about yesterday. The door to the past has been shut and the key thrown away. You can do nothing about tomorrow. It is yet to come. However, tomorrow is in large part determined by what you do today. So make today a masterpiece. This rule is even more important in life than in basketball. You have to apply yourself each day to become a little better. By applying yourself to the task of becoming a little better each and every day over a period of time, you will become a lot better. Only then will you be able to approach being the best you can be. Isn't the idea of making today a masterpiece appealing? The question is, how? What does it take? I believe there are two ingredients necessary to make every day a masterpiece. Decisions and discipline. They are like two sides of the same coin. You could call them goal-setting and goal-getting. And they can't be separated because one is worthless without the other. I say that because good decisions minus daily discipline equal a plan without a payoff. 
Daily discipline minus good decisions equal regimentation without reward. Good decisions plus daily discipline equal a masterpiece of potential. Time is like a block of marble. Give a block of marble to an average person and you end up with a block of marble. But put it in the hands of a master sculptor and watch what happens. The sculptor looks at it with an artist's eye. First he makes decisions about what it will be. Then he practices the disciplines of his craft until he has transformed lifeless stone into a masterpiece. I believe you and I can become like the sculptor. We can learn to become master craftsmen of our lives. You begin to build a better life by determining to make good decisions, but that alone is not enough. You need to know what decisions to make. I've given the subject a lot of thought, talked to many successful people, and narrowed down the list of critical areas for success to twelve. I call them the Daily Dozen. Number one, attitude. Choose and display the right attitudes daily. Number two, priorities. Determine and act on important priorities daily. Number three, health. Know and follow healthy guidelines daily. Number four, family. Communicate with and care for my family daily. Number five, thinking. Practice and develop good thinking daily. Number six, commitment. Make and keep proper commitments daily. Number seven, finances. Make and properly manage dollars daily. Number eight, faith. Deepen and live out my faith daily. Number nine, relationships. Initiate and invest in solid relationships daily. Number ten, generosity. Plan for and model generosity daily. Number eleven, values. Embrace and practice good values daily. And number twelve, growth. Seek and experience improvements daily. Before going any further, I need to make something clear. Please don't let the length of the list bother you. What I'm suggesting is that you take some time to think through these areas and make a major decision in each that will be lifelong. You can settle an issue once and for all, and you won't have to revisit it daily. The most successful people in life are the ones who settle their critical issues early and manage them daily. The earlier you settle the critical issues of your life, the greater your potential for success. The first ingredient of success, making good decisions, has no real value without the second, which is practicing good discipline. Let's face it, everyone wants to be thin, but nobody wants to diet. Everyone wants to live long, but not many people want to exercise. Everybody wants money, yet few want to work hard. Successful people conquer their feelings and form the habit of doing things unsuccessful people do not like to do. The bookends of success are starting and finishing. Decisions help us start. Discipline helps us finish. Most people want to avoid pain, and discipline is often painful. But we need to recognize that there are really two kinds of pain when it comes to our daily conduct. There's the pain of self-discipline and the pain of regret. Many people avoid the pain of self-discipline because it's the easy thing to do. What they may not realize is that the pain of self-discipline is momentary, but the payoff is long-lasting. If we've made a decision to try to be healthy, but we put off exercising, it's true that we avoid 30 minutes of unpleasantness. But then we feel guilty because we violated the decision we know was right for us. Then we regret not having exercised. And if we constantly avoid exercise, we end up paying a price later. On the other hand, when we do practice the discipline of exercise for 30 minutes, we feel good about ourselves the entire day. That's a great trade-off. We get 16 hours of positive feelings about ourselves for half an hour of work. And if we consistently practice the discipline of exercise, we also receive a health benefit that can literally save and extend our lives. Because we already have so many reasons not to start in the back of our minds, let me encourage you by giving you some compelling ideas about getting started. 
Start with yourself. A few years ago, on a trip to India, I got the opportunity to visit the home of that nation's great leader, Mahatma Gandhi. The house has been turned into a museum, and it contains some of his personal possessions as well as artifacts from his time of leadership. It also teaches much of his philosophy. One of his statements that I saw there struck me. Be the change you want to see in the world. What a great statement. If you desire for just one person close to you, your spouse, your children, a close friend, an employee, to change in some way, then become a model of change yourself. When that happens, you gain experience, confidence, integrity, and influence. You become content with yourself. You must have something to give before you can give to others. Start small. When you start small and succeed, it helps you believe that you can accomplish the next step. It also helps you to prioritize your actions and focus your energy. But here's a piece of advice. As you get ready to begin, don't expect to understand all of what it will take to get to the top. Just focus on the next step. Start early. There's an old saying that Noah didn't wait for his ship to come in. He built one. If you take a proactive approach to changing your life and you start early, you increase your odds for success and you create more options for yourself later in life. As you keep listening, you will become acquainted with my personal history and how I came to make each decision for practicing one of the daily dozen. I share it because I want to flesh out the process for you and let you know that I'm trying to live out the principles I teach about. And I'll tell you where I struggle. I'm not pretending that I do all of this perfectly, but you'll also find that I had the good fortune to make many of these decisions early in life. In my teens, I made four decisions. In my twenties, five decisions. In my thirties, two decisions. And in my fifties, I made only one decision. The earlier I made the decision and consistently practiced the discipline, the greater the compounding effect on my life. The same will be true for you. Decision number one. Today's attitude gives me possibilities. Is it possible for an individual to have success without a good attitude? The answer is yes, but their attitude will determine how much they enjoy the success. Sigmund Freud is an example of someone with a poor attitude who was otherwise able to achieve. The father of modern psychotherapy was hailed as a groundbreaking genius during his lifetime, wrote numerous books, and influenced several generations of physicians, artists, and thinkers. He has been called one of the most influential people of the 20th century. Yet from the time he was a teenager, he was pessimistic, skeptical, and often depressed. He tried to relieve his distress with cocaine beginning at 28 years of age. He believed that happiness was difficult to experience and that unhappiness was the lot of most people. In his book, Civilization and Its Discontents, Freud wrote, What good to us is a long life if it is difficult and barren of joys, and if it is so full of misery that we can only welcome death as a deliverer? Without a doubt, his attitude, not his accomplishments, influenced his outlook on life. What's sad is he chose his discontent. Here's why attitude makes such a difference as you approach your day. Your attitude at the beginning of a task affects its outcome more than anything else. You've heard the phrase, all's well that ends well. Here's another that I believe is equally true. All's well that begins well. Look at successful people and you'll see that they've embraced this truth, whether it's a doctor going into surgery, a coach readying his team for a game, a pastor preparing a sermon, or a business person entering negotiations before a big deal. The confident person increases his chances for success. The pessimist invites the negative outcome he expects. Charlie Wetzel, who works with me on my books, recently underwent a change in attitude in his thinking concerning the process of editing. He is a writer and has never particularly enjoyed the editing process. It reminds him of when he graded students' papers as an English composition teacher. Recently, when we were working on my book, There's No Such Thing as Business Ethics, 
He received the edited manuscript from the publisher and was asked to review it, check the editor's changes, and verify facts. It's a process he normally hates, because he thinks it takes time away from the writing he should be doing. But this time he decided to change his attitude as he approached the task. Rather than performing the task in short blocks of time during afternoons, because mornings are prime writing times, he blocked off an entire week just for editing, and he looked at the task as an opportunity to refine the manuscript and take it to the next level. As a result, the job was more enjoyable and the results were more effective. When you approach a task, especially an important one you don't relish, fix your mind on the facts, not on your feelings. Focus on the possibilities, not the problems. That will put your attitude on the right track. And if it starts on the right track, it's more likely to end up at the right destination. Your attitude can give you a winner's perspective. On June 28, 1939, Joe Lewis defended his heavyweight boxing title against Tony Tutan Galento in Yankee Stadium. Galento wasn't a particularly talented fighter, but he could take a punch and he was a big hitter. In the second round, Lewis knocked Galento down and seemed to be controlling the fight. But in the third round, Galento knocked the champ down. Lewis immediately jumped back to his feet and went after his opponent. When Lewis went to his corner, his trainer chastised him. You know you're supposed to take a full count when you go down. Why didn't you stay down for nine? What? answered Lewis. And give him a chance to rest? Lewis pummeled Galento so badly in the fourth round that the referee stopped the fight. In today's competitive culture, everybody is looking for an edge. Top athletes and top business people alike know that all things being equal, attitude wins. But this is also true. All things not being equal, attitude sometimes still wins. Possessing a great attitude is like having a secret weapon. Your attitude is contagious. One of my mentors, Fred Smith, once told me that there are two kinds of people in any organization, polluters and purifiers. Polluters are like smokestacks, belching out dirty smoke all the time. They hate clear skies, and no matter how good it gets, they can find a way to make it gloomy. When the people around them in the organization breathe their toxins, they feel sicker and sicker. Purifiers, on the other hand, make everything around them better. It doesn't matter what kind of rotten atmosphere they encounter. They take in the toxic words of polluters in the organization, just as everyone else does, but they filter the words before passing them on. What goes in may be gloomy and negative, but when it comes back out, it's fresh and clear. When you spend time with others, do they walk away feeling better or worse? Do you clear the air, giving them a fresh perspective and positive encouragement, or do they go away feeling gloomy? Watch how people respond to you, and you'll know which kind of a person you are. I discovered the importance of attitude in 1964 when I was 17 years old. My high school basketball coach, Don Neff, took me aside at the beginning of my senior season and told me that he wanted me to be the captain of the team. I was excited, but I was also a little surprised because I knew that my teammate, John Thomas, was a better player than I was. But then Coach Neff said something that explained it. John, he said, you have the best attitude on the team, and it influences the other players. Just a few weeks later, I was named Citizen of the Month at my school. Why? Once again, it was because of my attitude. My teachers said they loved my attitude. Then it sank in. My attitude was making a difference in my life, and it was making an impact on people around me. That's when I made my attitude decision. I am going to keep a positive attitude and use it to influence others. Your attitude is a choice. If you desire to make your day a masterpiece, then you need to have a great attitude. If it's not good now, you need to change it. Make the decision. Here's how. First, Take responsibility for your attitude. After my wife, Margaret, and I had been married for four or five years, we went to a conference for pastors where I had been asked to be one of the speakers. Margaret also agreed to do a breakout session for spouses, and I attended her session. During the Q&A time, a woman asked, Does John make you happy? 
I have to say I was really looking forward to hearing Margaret's answer. I'm an attentive husband, and I love Margaret dearly. What kind of praise would she lavish on me? Does John make me happy, she considered? No, he doesn't. I looked to see where the closest exit was. The first two or three years we were married, she continued, I thought it was John's job to make me happy, but he didn't. He wasn't mean to me or anything. He's a good husband, but nobody can make another person happy. That's my job. As a young newlywed in her early twenties, she figured out something some people never learn. Each of us must take responsibility for our own attitude. If you want today to be a good day, you need to take charge of the way you look at it. Second, decide to change your bad attitude areas. I've read the Peanuts comic strip for years, and I've always been a big fan. I recall one strip in which Lucy announces, Boy, do I feel crabby. Her little brother Linus, always anxious to relieve tension at home, responds, Maybe I can be of help. Why don't you just take my place here in front of the TV while I go and fix you a nice snack? Sometimes we all need a little pampering to help us feel better. Then Linus brings her a sandwich, a few chocolate chip cookies, and some milk. Now, is there anything else I can get for you, he asks? Is there anything I haven't thought of? Yes, there's one thing you haven't thought of, Lucy answers, and then she suddenly screams, I don't want to feel better. For the many years the late Charles Schultz drew peanuts, that always seemed to be one of Lucy's problems. She didn't want to change in the areas where she had a bad attitude, and she had a lot of them. Many people are like her. There are things in your life you cannot choose, such as your parents, where you were born, or your race, but your attitude is something you can change, and just about everybody has at least a few areas in their thinking that could use some help. If you want to have a better day, then you need to go after those areas. The third step is to think, act, talk, and conduct yourself like the person you want to become. If you've been to any kind of class reunion ten or more years after graduation, then you've probably been surprised by the transformation of one of your former classmates. The misfit who became a famous lawyer, the plain Jane who blossomed into a movie star, or the geek who founded a major corporation. How do such transformations occur? Those people saw themselves as they could be. Then they learned to act like and acquire the skills of the people they wanted to be. If you desire to change yourself, then start with your mind. Believe you can improve, then you can change into the person you desire to be. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, What lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. Develop a high appreciation for life. A friend emailed to me the story of a very together and independent 92-year-old lady who was moving into a nursing home. Since she was legally blind and her husband of 70 years had passed away, the move was her only option. She waited in the lobby of the facility for a long time before finally being told that her room was ready. As she was escorted down the corridor, her attendant described the room, down to the curtains hung on the windows. I love it, the elderly lady enthused. But you haven't even seen the room yet. Just wait, the attendant responded. That doesn't have anything to do with it, she replied. Happiness is something you decide on ahead of time. Whether I like my room or not doesn't depend on how the furniture is arranged. It's how I arrange my mind. Appreciation isn't a matter of taste or sophistication. It's a matter of perspective. John Wooden said, Things turn out best for the people who make the best of the way things turn out. The place to start is with the little things. If you can learn to appreciate them and be grateful for them, You'll appreciate the big things as well as everything in between. If you want to benefit from the possibilities of a positive attitude, you need to do more than just make the decision to be positive. You also have to manage that decision. For me, in the area of attitude, it means one thing. Every day, I will make the adjustments necessary to keep my attitude right. If this is new territory for you, you may be wondering how to do it. Here are some guidelines to help you on your way. 
Recognize that your attitude needs daily adjustment. I've discovered that a person's attitude does not naturally or easily stay positive. For example, a lifelong attitude weakness I've had is my impatience with people, and I still fight it. Every day I ask myself, have I been impatient with someone? When I have, I apologize to the person. I've had to do that more times than I'd like to admit. Like any discipline, your attitude will not take care of itself. That's why it needs to be attended to daily. The stronger your natural inclination to be pessimistic or critical, the more attention your attitude will need. Begin each day with an attitude check, and watch for red flags signaling that your attitude might be in trouble. Find something positive in everything. Not long ago, I came across a prayer that I thought was wonderful. It said, Dear Lord, So far today, I am doing all right. I have not gossiped, lost my temper, been greedy, grumpy, nasty, selfish, or self-indulgent. I have not whined, cursed, or eaten any chocolate. However, I am going to get out of bed in a few minutes, and I will need a lot more help after that. Amen. It may not always be easy, but if you try hard enough, you can find something good, even in the midst of difficult situations. Find someone positive in every situation. Nothing helps a person to remain positive like having an ally. The world is filled with negative people. In fact, they often flock together. But positive people are everywhere, too. You'll often find them soaring above the negative people like eagles. When you do, seek them out. If you're having a hard time, get close and draft behind them the way racers do. If they're having difficulty, you be the one to go out front and make things easier. Two positive people are much better at fighting off the blues than someone going it alone. Remove negative words from your vocabulary. My father retired in his mid-seventies, but he has spent his entire life in public speaking. When I was a kid, he used to pay my brother Larry and me ten cents for every grammar mistake we found him making when he was preaching. You can do a similar kind of thing when it comes to your attitude. You or someone you enlist can be on the lookout for negative words in your vocabulary so that you can try to eliminate them. Eliminate these words. I can't. If only. I don't think. I don't have time. Maybe. And say these words instead. I can. I will. I know. I will make time. Absolutely. When I made the decision at age 17 to maintain a positive attitude, I did it because it was giving me immediate positive results. And that is what usually prompts us to make decisions. But as you get older and reflect more, you can see things much more clearly. Looking back, I can see the impact that my attitude has made in my life since 1964. In my teens, my attitude made me captain of the basketball team. In my 20s, my attitude helped me convince Margaret to marry me. In my 30s, my attitude helped me step out of my comfort zone by leaving my organization and taking a new position in California. In my 40s, my attitude kept me going during eight years of red tape and conflict while trying to build a new campus for my church. In my 50s, my attitude allowed me to bounce back from a heart attack. I can honestly say that for 40 years, my attitude has been my greatest asset in influencing others. And, as I approach my 60s, my attitude has motivated me to lead an effort to train and equip one million leaders internationally. I want to keep making a positive impact until the day I die. Decision number two. Today's priorities give me focus. Business consultant and author Michael LaBeouf says devoting a little of yourself to everything means committing a great deal of yourself to nothing. Focused concentration is one of the keys to success. To have focus, you must understand priorities. Here's why. Time is our most precious commodity. Given the choice, would you rather save time or money? Most people focus on dollars. But how you spend your time is much more important than how you spend your money. 
Money mistakes can often be corrected, but when you lose time, it's gone forever. Your priorities determine how you spend your time, and time is precious. The following statements may help you put time in perspective. To know the value of one year, ask the student who failed the final exam. To know the value of one month, ask the mother of a premature baby. To know the value of one week, ask the editor of a weekly news magazine. To know the value of one day, ask the wage earner who has six children. To know the value of one hour, ask the lovers who are waiting to meet. To know the value of one minute, ask the person who missed the plane. To know the value of one second, ask the person who survived the accident. And to know the value of one millisecond, ask the Olympic silver medalist. We cannot change time, only our priorities. Sales consultant and author Myers Barnes says, Time management has nothing to do with the clock, but everything to do with organizing and controlling your participation in certain events that coordinate with the clock. Einstein understood time management is an oxymoron. It cannot be managed. You can't save time, lose time, turn back the hands of time, or have more time tomorrow than today. Time is unemotional, uncontrolled, unencumbered. It moves forward regardless of circumstances and, in the game of life, creates a level playing field for everyone. Since you can't change time, you must instead change your approach to it. We cannot do everything. There was a time in my life when I thought I could do everything, but I was very young, energetic, and naive. Chinese author and philosopher Lin Yutang said, Besides the noble art of getting things done, there is the noble art of leaving things undone. The wisdom of life consists of the elimination of non-essentials. You can have anything you want, but you cannot have everything you want. You have to choose. Excellence comes from doing the right things right. If you're not sure what the right things are, pretend you have only six months to live. The things you would do in that short time are the right things. Priorities help us to choose wisely. Author Robert J. McCain says the reason most goals are not achieved is that we spend our time doing second things first. Let's face it, there are a lot of things vying for your attention. Many people want to put you on their agenda. Thousands of manufacturers want you to spend your money on their product. Even your own desires can be so diverse and your attention so scattered that you often aren't sure what should get your attention. That's why you need to focus. To be successful, you can't just run on the fast track. Instead, run on your own track. People who reach their potential and fulfill their dreams determine and act on their priorities daily. When I first graduated from college and began my career, I was not working according to my own agenda. Back in the 1960s, when I studied for the ministry, the majority of my coursework had prepared me to do counseling and administration. So when I began working in 1969, guess what I spent most of my time doing? That's right, counseling and administration. Nothing could have been farther from my natural gifts or my natural inclinations. Despite much hard work, I was neither fulfilled or effective. Because I wanted to improve myself and pick up skills I didn't learn in college, in 1971 I began working on a business degree. While reading for one of the courses, I came across a paragraph written about Italian economist Vilfredo Pareto. It contained information about prioritizing called the Pareto Principle. It said that by focusing your attention on the top 20% of all your priorities, you would get an 80% return on your effort. That was my eureka moment. That's when I made this decision. I will prioritize my life and give focus and energy to those things that give the highest return. From the moment I made that decision, I have been a practitioner of the Preto Principle and I have taught it to others for 33 years. If you want to change the way you look at yourself and what you do by making a decision concerning your priorities, then do the following. Take back today.
poet Carl Sandburg said, Time is the most valuable coin in your life. You and you alone will determine how that coin will be spent. Be careful that you do not let other people spend it for you. Your greatest possession is the 24 hours you have directly ahead of you. How will you spend it? Will you give in to the pressure or focus on priorities? Will you allow pointless emails, unimportant tasks, telemarketers, interruptions, and other distractions to consume your day? Or will you take complete responsibility for how you spend your time, take control of the things you can, and make today yours? If you don't decide how your day will be spent, someone else will. No daily dozen issue has added more to my success than the principle of priorities. When I discovered that I needed to change my approach to my day and my career, I started by asking myself three critical questions. Number one, what is required of me? Any realistic assessment of priorities in any area of life must start with a realistic assessment of what a person must do. For you to be a good spouse or parent, what is required of you? To satisfy your employer, what must you do? When ordering priorities, always start with the requirement question and give it careful thought before moving on to the next question. Number two, what gives me the greatest return? As you progress in your career, you begin to discover that some activities yield a much higher return for the effort than others do. The next place to focus your attention is on those high return activities. Question number three, what gives me the greatest reward? If you do only what you must and what is effective, you will be highly productive, but you may not be content. I think it's also important to consider what gives you personal satisfaction. However, I find that some people want to start with the reward question and go no farther than that. No one can be successful who doesn't possess the discipline to take care of the first two areas before adding the third. It was a great day in my church when I stopped counseling people and stopped getting bogged down in administrative details. But finding my strength zone took some time and exploration. If you don't already have a good handle on your strengths, then you may want to explore some of these suggestions. They're based on what I did to find mine. Mm -hmm. Trial and Error Nothing teaches you more than your successes and failures. Anytime something seems to be all trial and you make a lot of mistakes, it's probably time to move on. But you've got to take the risk of failing to find your successes. Next, consider the counsel of others. Asking others to evaluate your effectiveness is not always fun, but it is always helpful. Be sure to choose people who don't have an agenda other than to help you. Then take personality tests. Evaluations such as DISC, Florence Littower's personality profile, and Myers-Briggs can be very helpful. They will help to clarify some of your natural inclinations and to reveal some strengths and weaknesses you aren't aware of. Finally, examine your personal experience. You really get a feel for how well you do something by doing it repeatedly. Just remember this. Experience isn't always the best teacher. Evaluated experience is. One of the things I noticed very quickly after making my priorities decision was that priorities shift very easily. For that reason, they must be continually evaluated and guarded. My reminder to manage the disciplines of priorities is this. Every day, I will live my life according to my priorities. What does that mean? that the following five things must be done. 1. Evaluate priorities daily. Priorities don't stay put. You have to revisit them every day. Why? Because conditions continually change. So do methods of getting things done. Your values, once defined, are going to be steady. You will be able to rely on them. But how you carry them out needs to be flexible. Number 2. Plan your time carefully. According to a survey taken by Daytimers, Inc., only one-third of American workers plan their daily schedules, and only 9% follow through and complete what they planned. If you want to be effective, you must be able to make the transition to planning. I plan my calendar 40 days at a time. 
But when I get ready to approach a day, I have the whole thing laid out, hour by hour. It's a rare day that I get up in the morning wondering what I will be doing that day, even when on vacation. Number three, follow your plan. According to time management expert Alec McKenzie, surveys show that most executives don't get to their most important task until mid-afternoon. Why? Most finished off low-priority tasks so that they could have a sense of accomplishment. If you prioritize your life and plan your day but don't follow through, your results will be the same as those of someone who didn't prioritize at all. Number four, delegate whenever possible. How do you find the right standard for delegation? When is it right to hand something off, and when is it right to hold on to it? Here's the guideline I use. If someone else can do a task I'm doing 80% as well as I do, then I hand it off. And if I do a good job of motivating, encouraging, and rewarding them, then they will only get better. Number five, invest in the right people daily. How do you decide whom to spend time with? Certainly, you want to treat everyone with respect and try to have a good positive relationship with everyone, but you should not spend time with everyone equally. Here's what I use to evaluate where to invest my time. Value to the team. Natural ability. Responsibility. Timing. Potential. And mentoring fit. I am grateful that I learned to prioritize my life early in my career. No decision I've made has had as great an impact on my life and career. Here's how. In my 20s, my priorities took away the guilt of not doing everything. In my 30s, my priorities helped me separate my strengths from my weaknesses. In my 40s, my priorities gave me a high return on my work. In my 50s, my priorities allow me to staff according to my weaknesses. If you want to increase your focus and become effective on a level you've never experienced before, then make a decision to prioritize your life and manage the discipline of priorities every day. Anytime people reach the highest level in their profession, you can be sure that priorities have been very important to them. That was certainly the case of Betsy Rogers, a teacher in Leeds, Alabama, who became the 2003 National Teacher of the Year. Rogers can't remember a time when she didn't want to be a teacher. It was in her blood and in her family. Her grandmother taught in rural Alabama beginning when she was only 16 years old. Both her grandmother's sisters followed her into the profession, and Roger's mother taught Sunday school for 50 years. So when she went off to college, she naturally studied to become a teacher, too. I wanted to change the world for them, says Rogers. It took me several years to realize I could not change the world in which my students lived but by understanding that school was the best place for some of my children. I became committed to making my classroom a place where students feel safe, as well as creating an environment that provides joy to those with unfortunate lives. Rogers began teaching in 1974, immediately after finishing her degree. She took six years off to take care of her sons until they were school age, but she knew that as soon as they were old enough, she would be back in the classroom. And being connected in the community where she would teach was a priority. So in the early 1980s, she and her husband bought an abandoned farm near her school. Rogers says, When my husband and I moved our family from a more affluent neighborhood to Leeds 21 years ago, our purpose was to raise our children in an environment with a more diverse population with a rural background. Many of my colleagues did not believe it was beneficial to live in a community where you teach, but I have found this relationship with the Leeds community to be very rewarding and productive. By living and working in Leeds, I truly became a stakeholder in the community. By making that community connection a priority, she has been better able to help her students. She reaches out to parents has students over to her house, and attends many of their extracurricular activities. We should be very proud of our profession, she says, and we need to be models. We shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we have impact that we may never see. 
Because Rogers is focused, she is constantly improving and working to reach her potential in her profession. She believes that teachers must model a dedication to lifelong learning. And she doesn't just give lip service to it. When both her sons were in college, she went back to school herself. She has since earned three graduate degrees in 1998, 2000, and 2002. As National Teacher of the Year, she will be expected to spend a year visiting schools and serving as an international spokeswoman for education. When she's finished, she could use the recognition she has received as a springboard to a plum teaching position or a higher-paying administrative position. But that's not what she's about. According to County Superintendent Bob Neighbors, Rogers has inquired about going back to work in a county school on academic alert because of poor test scores. After all, what's the use of improving herself if she can't use what she's learned to help others? Neighbors call Rogers one of those extraordinary naturals for whom teaching is not only her vocation, it is her joy, her daily discovery, and her avocation. Rogers sums it up this way. I was taught that we are here on this earth to serve. That's her priority, and she is living it out every day. Decision number three. Today's health gives me strength. I need to begin this section by making a confession. Usually when people listen to a book, especially a book that contains advice, they expect the author to be an expert in every area he talks about. That is not the case with me when it comes to health. For much of my life, I have dropped the ball in this area. I lived a very fast-paced life. For about ten years, I held down two demanding jobs. I led a church of more than 3,000 people with a staff of over 50 and a budget of $5 million a year. At the same time, I led a leadership development organization that required me to travel and speak more than 100 days a year. When I gave up the pastorate to dedicate my time to my organization, I nearly doubled my travel. I also built up the company and increased the number of employees from 18 to 175. Maintaining a lifestyle at that pace meant that I rarely exercised. I didn't eat well and I was overweight. But I didn't worry. Every year I had a physical and received an excellent report from my doctor, so I simply took my health for granted. All that changed for me on December 18, 1998, the night of the annual Christmas party for my employees and their spouses. At the end of the party, I didn't feel well. One of my employees gave me a goodbye hug and felt cold sweat on the back of my neck. Then suddenly I felt an excruciating pain in my chest that brought me to my knees. As I lay on the floor awaiting the paramedics, it felt like an elephant was sitting on my chest. I was grateful that Margaret, our children, and many of my closest friends were there with me at the party because I thought I wasn't going to make it. When I got to the hospital, I was told that I was having a serious heart attack. In the wee hours of the morning, Dr. Jeff Marshall performed a procedure to remove a clot that made its way into my heart. He saved my life. Afterward, he explained that he had used a new procedure that had only recently been developed. If I'd had my heart attack a year or two earlier, nothing could have been done. It would have killed me. It almost seems too obvious to mention that your health matters today, yet I believe I must say it, because many people treat their bodies the way I did for more than 50 years. So here's a reminder of what's at stake when it comes to health. Your health impacts you emotionally, intellectually, and spiritually. You can escape from a lot of things that might hurt you. You can quit a hazardous job. You can move from one climate to another. You can stay away from someone who wants to harm you. But you can't get away from your body. For as long as you live, you're stuck with it. If you make choices that cause you to be continually hurting or unhealthy, it will affect every aspect of your life, your heart, your mind, and spirit. Health often determines quality as well as quantity of life. My friend Zig Ziglar asked the question, If you had a million-dollar racehorse, would you allow it to smoke cigarettes, drink whiskey, and stay out all night? How about a thousand-dollar dog? Of course you wouldn't. 
A thoroughbred horse that was not taken care of would never be capable of winning a race. A dog whose health ran down would not work effectively or show well. The real question is, if you wouldn't allow your animals to do such things, then why would you allow yourself to? It's easier to maintain good health than to regain it. People are funny. When they are young, they will spend their health to get wealth. Later, they will gladly pay all they have trying to get their health back. I fell into a similar trap, even though I wasn't trying to accumulate wealth. I was driven by a sense of mission and the desire to achieve. That caused me to make a number of costly mistakes. I was arrogant about my health. I thought because I felt good, I was healthy. I worked too hard. I did not exercise enough, and I didn't listen to loving friends who tried to warn me about my lifestyle. As I recovered from my heart attack in the hospital, I felt very fortunate to be alive. Cardiovascular diseases are the number one cause of death in the United States and Europe. But I didn't discover how blessed I was until Dr. Marshall told me that I had sustained no damage to my heart. That meant I had the potential to make a full recovery. At the age of 51, I made this health decision. I will take good care of myself by exercising and eating right. If you know the value of good health, yet you've had a hard time making the commitment to know and follow healthy guidelines, here are some suggestions to help you turn your attention to the subject and tackle it. Number one, have a purpose worth living for. It's hard to find motivation in the moment when there is no hope in the future. A sense of purpose helps a person to make a decision to change and then to follow through with the discipline required to make that change permanent. I found that to be true after my heart attack. A friend who spent a lot of time with me during my recovery saw me pass on desserts time after time, something that was not characteristic of me, and finally he asked, Have you lost your craving for desserts? No, I answered, but my craving for life is greater. Number two. Do work you enjoy. One of the greatest causes of debilitating stress in people's lives is doing jobs they don't enjoy. It's like comedian Lily Tomlin said, The problem with the rat race is that even if you win, you're still a rat. I believe two major frustrations contribute to that stress. The first is doing work you don't think is important. If you do work that you believe adds no value to yourself or to others, you quickly become demoralized. To remain healthy, your work must be in alignment with your values. Another reason some people don't like their work is because they do jobs that keep them in an area of weakness. Nobody can do that long and succeed. For example, most people hate the thought of public speaking. How would you like to get up in front of an audience and speak to them every day? That's some people's number one fear. One of the ways you can tell you're working in an area of strength is that it actually gives you energy. Even if you are in the early stages of your career or are starting out on a new venture and you're not very good at something you're doing, you can still tell it's an area of strength by paying attention to how you respond to your failures. Mistakes that challenge you show your areas of strengths. Mistakes that threaten you show areas of your weaknesses. Number three, find your pace. Part of taking care of yourself includes finding and maintaining the pace that's right for you. If you take life more slowly than your energy level is capable of, you can become lazy. If you continually run at a pace faster than you are capable, you can burn out. You need to find your balance. Even today, at age 57, I still have a tendency to take on too much and go at a faster pace than is really good for me. There are so many opportunities I want to pursue, books I want to write, and people I want to help. I'm constantly trying to strike a balance between my desire to maintain a healthy pace of life and my drive to accomplish all I can during my lifetime. Number four, accept your personal worth. Psychologist Joyce Brothers says, An individual self-concept affects every aspect of human behavior. The ability to learn, 
the capacity to grow and change, the choice of friends, mates, and careers. It is no exaggeration to say that a strong, positive self-image is the best possible preparation for success in life. If your self-image is driving you to do things that negatively impact your health, seek help. Number 5. Laugh Physician Bernie S. Siegel wrote in Peace, Love, and Healing, I've done the research, and I hate to tell you, but everybody dies. Lovers, jockers, vegetarians, and non-smokers. I'm telling you this so that some of you who jog at 5 a.m. and eat vegetables will occasionally sleep late and have an ice cream cone. We should never take life or ourselves too seriously. Each of us has idiosyncrasies that can cause us to despair or to laugh. For example, when it comes to anything related to tools or technology, I'm clueless. I'm not Mr. Handyman. I'm Mr. Hopeless. I don't let that bother me at all. If you can laugh at yourself loudly and often, you will find it liberating. There's no better way to prevent stress from becoming distress. After meeting with Dr. Marshall following my heart attack, I had a new discipline to manage. Every day I will eat low-fat foods and exercise for at least 35 minutes. He told me that 85% of all heart patients quit their healthy regimen within six months. Even though I had not succeeded in this area my first 50 years, I was determined to succeed in it the rest of my life. Margaret and I learned everything we could about heart issues, low-fat diets, and exercise. I became a model of discipline. And in May of 2001, when I visited Dr. Marshall, he congratulated me. John, he said, you're doing all the right things. You don't need to consider yourself a heart patient anymore. I wish I would have never heard those words. You see, I love food, and I possess a foodaholic bent. Because of that good news I received from Dr. Marshall, I gave myself permission to cheat on my diet once in a while, something I had not done once in two and a half years. The problem was that I quit managing my life according to the decision I made. I had relaxed my discipline. Once my commitment was less than 100%, I got into trouble. I need to exercise and stay on my diet every day. But I began to slide from every day to most days to some days. I ignored my own teaching that today matters. Neglect enough todays and you'll experience the someday you've wanted to avoid. The good news is that I'm no longer off the wagon. I'm recommitted to my daily discipline. The bad news is that I'm doing only 80% of what I was doing before. Dr. Marshall is trying to help me. He's a good doctor and a good friend. And he knows that sometimes the best medicine is a good kick in the butt. The area of health is still a battle, but it's one that I'm determined to win. Successful people make the major decisions in their life early and manage them daily. In the other sections of this book, I try to show you how the decisions I made and the disciplines I practiced have created a positive compounding effect in my life. I'm sorry to say that I can't do that when it comes to health. Instead, I'll tell you how poor decisions have had a different kind of effect. In my teens, I developed many bad eating habits. In my 20s, food became a stress reliever when I worked especially hard. In my 30s, I finally started to exercise, but it was usually last on my agenda. In my 40s, I realized I needed to attend to my health and made a decision to change, but I failed to add the necessary daily discipline. In my 50s, I finally made the decision to know and follow healthy guidelines daily, a commitment that I am working hard to keep. Perhaps you have fallen short in one or more of the areas discussed so far. Please don't be discouraged and don't give up. The following words were written for you and me at times like this. Though you cannot go back and make a brand new start, my friend, you can start now and make a brand new end. Decision number four, today's family gives me stability. 
What difference does family make? How does it impact an individual's life? Let's face it, some people's families don't build them up, they tear them down. It's true that you can't do anything to change your ancestry or upbringing. You have no control over what your parents or grandparents did or how they treated you. But while you can't do much about your ancestors, you can influence your descendants greatly. You determine how you treat your family. You're the one who decides whether you will stay and work things out or leave your family when the going gets rough, as it always does. You're the one who decides how much time you spend with the relatives who build you up versus those who try to knock you down. You determine how you treat others. The way you approach family life has a profound impact on how you live. If you're willing to work at it, and I know that for people with especially difficult families, it can be an incredible amount of work, your family can become a source of stability and strength. A healthy, supportive family is like a safe haven in a storm. People have to deal with a lot of pressure these days. The workplace is demanding. Schools are often hostile environments. The pace of life is out of control. Where can a person find shelter in such a climate? If it is not at home, then it probably isn't anywhere. A reporter once asked President Theodore Roosevelt with whom did he enjoy spending most of his time. He responded he would rather spend time with his family than with any of the world's notables. For him and for his family, home was a safe haven in the midst of a storm. A healthy family also provides a photo album of memories. Think back to your own childhood. What are your favorite memories? What positive images still make you smile? If you have children, which of their memories do you think are their favorites? You may want to ask them. The more positive and loving the environment you strive to create at home, the more good memories they will have to keep them grounded. Your family can also be a crucible of character. Your family life not only helps to form the character of any children living at home, but it also continues to mold your character as an adult. Your character is little more than the collection of choices you make and the habits you cultivate every day. Since your family creates your primary environment, it influences those choices and habits. Strong, healthy families encourage people to make constructive choices, to develop positive disciplines, and to pay the price today for success tomorrow. And a supportive family is a treasure chest of your most important relationships. There's no doubt that the relationships you have with members of your immediate family and with your spouse are the most important ones in your life. The people closest to you form you and are formed by you. That should be reason enough to value them. When Mother Teresa received the Nobel Peace Prize, she was asked, What can we do to promote world peace? Her answer, Go home and love your family. If you want to make a positive impact, no matter how far-reaching, start at home. Treat your family members like treasures. Years ago, I cut out a quote by Nick Stennett that summarized the importance of family. It reads, When you have a strong family life, you receive the message that you are loved, cared for, and important. The positive intake of love, affection, and respect gives you inner resources to deal with life more successfully. In other words, family gives you stability. In 1986, when I was 39 years old, I began to notice a terrible trend. The marriages of some of my colleagues, college buddies, and friends were falling apart and ending in divorce. That really got my attention because even some of the relationships that Margaret and I had considered to be strong had fallen by the wayside. We didn't think our relationship was in any kind of danger, but I also discovered that prior to their breakdowns, some of the couples had thought nothing like that could ever happen to them. This all occurred about the same time my career was really taking off. I still wanted to be successful, but I didn't want to lose my family in the process. That prompted me to make one of my key life decisions, and I would do so by rewriting my definition of success. From that moment, success meant having those closest to me love and respect me the most. 
I don't know where you stand with your family now. Everyone's situation is unique. You may have a great family life, or you may have made some serious mistakes from which you fear you will never recover. You may be single with no children, so that all you have is extended family. But I can tell you this. No matter what your situation is, you can benefit from the stability that comes from communicating with and caring for your family daily. Here's how to get started. Determine your priorities. There's a Russian proverb that gives this advice. Before going to war, pray once. Before going to sea, pray twice. Before getting married, pray three times. In other words, any time you're going to engage in a great and potentially risky endeavor, give it serious consideration first. How else are you going to know where it ranks in priority in your life? I learned this lesson the hard way. In the space of one month in 1969, I graduated from college, got married to Margaret, and started my first job. As soon as we got back from our honeymoon, we moved to a new town, and I started working. I was the senior pastor of a small country church, and I was determined to be successful. I threw myself into the job, giving it everything I had. And when I say everything, I mean everything. I worked all day at the church, and every evening I set appointments to meet with people in the community. I worked a six-day work week, but I cheated by working on my day off, too. Meanwhile, Margaret worked a couple of jobs to keep us going financially because my salary was so low. The problem was that I was neglecting her and our marriage. Margaret and I have known each other since high school, and we dated for six years before we got married. So we had a lot of history together, especially for a couple so young. Back then, I believed our history was going to carry us through while I devoted myself to my career. But a marriage can't survive forever on leftovers. It needs to be fed continually, or it will eventually starve. Decide on your philosophy. In the first decade of our marriage, Margaret and I decided on our personal philosophy of family. First, we tried to live it out as a couple. Then, when we had children, we worked to make it the foundation of our choices as parents. For us, the bottom line on family was for us to cultivate and maintain our commitment to God. Our faith came first in our lives. If we neglected or compromised that, nothing else would be of value. Our continual growth, reaching our personal potential and helping our children do the same, is one of our highest values. When we come to the end of our lives, we want to look back knowing that we live life to the fullest. Our Common Experiences The greatest bonds between people come as a result of their experiences together, both good and bad. We create as many positive experiences as we can, and we weather the negative ones together. Our Confidence in God, ourselves, and others Your belief determines how you will live and it also impacts the outcome of everything that you do. And our contributions to life. People should try to leave the world a better place than they found it. We want to add value not only to the people in our family, but also to every other life we touch. I know that you will want to create your list. Here's my suggestion. Keep it simple. If you come up with a list of 17 things you want to live out, you won't be able to do it. You may not even be able to remember it. Whittle the list down to the non-negotiables. Develop your problem-solving strategy. I think a lot of people go into marriage expecting it to be easy. Maybe they've seen too many movies. Marriage isn't easy. Family isn't easy. Life isn't easy. Expect problems, stay committed, and develop a strategy for getting through the rough times. Some people call family meetings to discuss issues. Others create systems or rules. Use whatever kind of problem-solving strategy works for you. Just be sure that it fosters and promotes three things. One, better understanding. Two, positive change. And three, growing relationships. The desire to make your family a priority is one thing. Actually, living it out is something else. I found that it's often easier to get the approval of strangers and colleagues than it is to get respect from those who know you best. So I practiced this discipline. 
Every day I work hard on gaining the love and respect of those closest to me. Years ago, when something exciting happened during the day, or I heard a bit of interesting news, I'd share it with colleagues and friends. By the time I got home, I had little enthusiasm for sharing it with Margaret. So I purposely began keeping things to myself until I could share them with Margaret first. That way, she never got the leftovers. I found the best way to place my family first is to give them some of my best energy and attention. If you desire to strengthen your family life and make it a source of stability, then try practicing some of these disciplines. Put your family on your calendar first. I have found that my work will gobble up every bit of my time if I let it. Before I made the decision to make my family a priority, I didn't give them the time that I should have. I think that's true of most people who enjoy their careers. Other people have hobbies or interests that can be very time-consuming. If you don't create boundaries for how you spend your time, your family will always get the leftovers. Even today, if I let my guard down, I'm liable to let work take over my schedule. Someone once said that you should never let yourself feel that you ought to be at work when you're with your family, and you should never feel that you ought to be with your family when you're at work. That's a great perspective. If you and your family can figure out and agree on how much time you should spend together and you protect those times, you should be able to adopt that mindset. Try to create and maintain family traditions. Traditions give your family a shared history and a strong sense of identity. Don't you remember how your family celebrated Thanksgiving as a child or how about Christmas? The traditions your family kept helped you define who you were and who your family was. Give thought to how you want to enjoy holidays, mark milestones, and celebrate rites of passage in your family. Start by basing traditions on your values. Add others you enjoyed from your childhood. If you're married, include those of your spouse as well. Mix in cultural elements if you want. Build some around your children's interest. Give traditions meaning and make them your own. It's vital to keep your marriage healthy. The relational foundation of any family is a couple's marriage. It sets the tone for the household and is the model relationship that children learn from more than any other. That's why former Notre Dame President Theodore Hesba asserted, The most important thing a father can do for his children is to love their mother. No marriage is easy to keep going. It's been said that a successful marriage is one that can go from crisis to crisis with a growth in commitment. That's what it's really all about. Commitment. Commitment is what carries you through. People who use their feelings as a barometer for the health of their marriage are destined for a breakup. If you intend to stay married only as long as you feel the love, you might as well give up. Just like anything else worth fighting for, marriage requires daily discipline and commitment. As I reflect on my family decision, I look back with intense gratitude to Margaret and my children, and I realize that in my thirties, my family decision gave me protection from making the life-shattering mistakes of many of my friends. In my forties, my family decision helped me place my family first. In my fifties, my family decision has allowed me to see the positive outcome of the success of my grown children. For 18 years, my family and I have benefited from my decision to live by a different definition of success. I can't imagine what life would have been like without the stability provided by my family. Decision number five. Today's thinking gives me an advantage. Claude M. Bristol, author of The Magic of Believing, said, Thought is the original source of all wealth, all success, all material gain, all great discoveries and inventions, and all achievement. That's a bold statement. What kind of value do you put on good thinking? Has it been a priority in your life? Have you considered thinking to be a decision and discipline to be practiced daily? Here are some reasons to make thinking a priority in your life every day. Good thinking increases your value. Who has the greatest value in any organization? 
The answer is the person with the ideas. Industrialist Harvey Firestone said, Capital isn't so important in business. Experience isn't so important. You can get both these things. What is important is ideas. If you have ideas, you have the main asset you need, and there isn't any limit to what you can do with your business and your life. Ideas are what our country was founded on. Ideas have helped to create great companies and to drive our economy, the largest in the world. Ideas are the foundation for everything we build, every advance we make. When a person is a good thinker and has lots of ideas, he or she becomes very valuable. If you're a good thinker, you have a great advantage. Poor thinkers are slaves to their surroundings. People who do not develop and practice good thinking often find themselves at the mercy of their circumstances. They are unable to solve problems, and they find themselves facing the same obstacles over and over again. And because they don't think ahead, they are habitually in a reaction mode. An old German proverb says, Better an empty purse than an empty head. Good thinkers can always overcome difficulties, including lack of resources. And poor thinkers are also frequently at the mercy of good thinkers. My father required all three of his children to read for thirty minutes every day. Sometimes we chose what we read, but often he selected the reading material for us. Two of the books he asked me to read made a profound impression on me. The first was The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale, which I read in the seventh grade. That year, my father also took me to Veterans Memorial Auditorium in Columbus, Ohio, to hear and meet Dr. Peel. That experience shaped my life. Even more impacting than meeting Dr. Peel was reading As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. I read the book in 1961 when I was 14 years old, and it made such an impression on me that I was prompted to make one of my daily dozen decisions. I still have the book. On page 49, Allen wrote, All that a man achieves or fails to achieve is the direct result of his thoughts. The entire book made an impression on me, but that statement made me realize that my thinking would make or break me. So I decided, I will think on things that will add value to myself and others. If you desire to make good thinking a daily part of your life, consider this. Recognize there are many kinds of thinking. I believe eleven different thinking skills come into play when it comes to good thinking. I wrote about them in detail in Thinking for a Change. Here's an overview of the skills. Number one, big picture thinking. The ability to think beyond yourself and your world in order to process ideas with a holistic perspective. Number two, focus thinking. The ability to think with clarity on issues by removing distractions and mental clutter from your mind. Number three, creative thinking. The ability to break out of your box of limitations and explore ideas and options to experience a breakthrough. Number four, realistic thinking. The ability to build a solid foundation on facts to think with certainty. Number five, strategic thinking. The ability to implement plans that give direction for today and increase your potential for tomorrow. Number six, possibility thinking. The ability to unleash your enthusiasm and hope to find solutions for even seemingly impossible situations. Number seven, reflective thinking. The ability to revisit the past in order to gain a true perspective and think with understanding. Number eight, questioning popular thinking, the ability to reject the limitations of common thinking and accomplish uncommon results. Number nine, shared thinking, the ability to include the heads of others to help you think over your head and achieve compounding results. Number ten, unselfish thinking, the ability to consider others and their journey to think with collaboration. Number eleven, bottom line thinking, the ability to focus on results and maximum return to reap the full potential of your thinking. If you recognize that there are many different kinds of thinking, what should you do? 
Should you try to master all of them? No, I believe that's a mistake. Let's say, for example, that you are a very good creative thinker, but you're weak in bottom-line thinking, yet you want to master both kinds of thinking. How would you get started? Where would you focus your attention? You could probably work on bottom-line thinking to get it up to average, but that would require a tremendous amount of time, energy, and resources. And what would it take to advance to merely good? It would take even more effort. The higher you try to climb, the more energy it takes to make less progress. No matter how hard you try, you might not ever make bottom-line thinking a strength. What if you gave that time to improving your creative thinking instead? Since you are already good, a moderate amount of time and energy could make you excellent. If you really gave it your all, perhaps you could become a world-class creative thinker. That would enable you to generate ideas and make contributions few others could. That would make you much more valuable and give you a real advantage in your life and career. So what do you do about your weaknesses? Gather people around you who are strong in those areas. That's what I've done for years. In my current season of life, I can hire staff who possess strengths in my areas of weakness. But even before I was the boss, I practiced this principle. For 35 years, my wife Margaret and I have worked as a team to compensate for one another's weaknesses. I've often relied on my brother Larry to help me in the area of realistic thinking. And I've made it a practice to partner with friends who think better than I do in a particular area while I do the same for them. Not having to rely entirely on myself when it comes to thinking has been a real advantage to me. It's easy to allow situations and other people to influence your thinking negatively as well as positively. One of the tricky things about seeking ideas and perspective from others is that some people have an agenda other than helping you. That's why it's important to take responsibility for your own thinking. When I was in my 20s, I began to practice this discipline. Every day, I will set aside a time to think, and I will determine to think on the right things. If you desire to do the same thing, then do this. Find a place to think. I want to encourage you to find a thinking place. When it comes to what works, everybody is different. Some people like to be connected to nature. Others want to be in the midst of, but removed from, activity. My friend Andy Stanley likes to sit alone in a restaurant to think. He says he needs a little distraction. J.K. Rowling, author of the Harry Potter books, wrote her early books while sitting in a cafe. Where you go doesn't matter as long as it stimulates your thinking. Set aside think time every day. As important as finding the right place to think is carving out the time, I do nearly all my best thinking early in the morning, except for reflective thinking. I usually do that in the evenings before I go to bed. That's when I review my day and try to measure how I did with my daily dozen. But all the other kinds of thinking come best to me in the morning. I often wake up in the wee hours and spend time just getting ideas on a legal pad while sitting in my thinking chair. I recommend that you try to discover the time of day when your thinking is the sharpest. Then set aside a block of time every day just to think. I believe you'll find that you're much more productive and focused as a result. Capture your thoughts. I always write down my thoughts. When I'm in my thinking spot, I use a legal pad. The rest of the day, I keep a small leather-bound notebook with me. I even have something to write with next to my bed at night, a small pad with a light attached that illuminates when you remove the pen. That way I can write a note while still in bed without disturbing Margaret by turning on a light. Have a system and use it. Try to improve your thinking every day. It's true that the more thinking you do, the better you become at it. But you can quickly improve your thinking if you do the following on a daily basis. Number one, focus on the positive. Thinking alone won't guarantee success. You need to think about the right things. Negative thinking and worry actually hinder the thinking process rather than improve it. I believe in this so wholeheartedly that the first book I wrote was a collection of short, uplifting, and instructive chapters. I called it Think on These Things. 
based on a Bible passage that always inspired me. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Focus on the positive, and your thinking will move in a positive direction. Number two, gather good input. I have always been a collector of ideas. I do a lot of reading, and I continually file the ideas and quotes I find. I found that the more good ideas I am exposed to, the more my thinking improves. And number three, spend time with good thinkers. If you were to interview a group of top executives in any profession, you would find that well over half had had the benefit of being mentored at some time in their careers. And I believe that the greatest benefit anyone receives in that kind of relationship is learning how the mentor thinks. If you spend time with good thinkers, you will find that the exposure sharpens your thinking. When I was young and highly energetic, I was all for action. But the longer I live, the more I cherish my thinking time. Perhaps that's because I have begun to realize the value it has brought to me. In my teens, my thinking began to be focused on that which was positive. In my twenties, my thinking separated me from many of my peers. In my thirties, my thinking gave me an audience and a following. In my forties, my thinking took my work to a much higher level. In my fifties, my thinking has taken me to a much higher level. And the best part is that I'm not done yet. I believe my best thinking is still ahead of me. I'm always trying to increase the quantity and the quality of my thinking because few things give as great a return as good ideas. When a person's thinking is good, a lot of other things in life take care of themselves. Decision number six. Today's commitment gives me tenacity. What were you born to do? What do you think your future holds? Do you believe that you have a purpose or a destiny? If so, will you fulfill it? To become the person you have the potential to be, you will need great tenacity. That quality comes from commitment. Listen to these truths concerning commitment. Commitment can change your life. Think about a time in your life when you made a real commitment to do something differently. Didn't your life change as a result? It may have not turned out exactly as you expected, but it undoubtedly set you on a new course. If you want to change, you must embrace commitment. Your commitment will be tested every day. I think many people see commitment as an event, something that is done in a moment. They say, I do, in a wedding ceremony. They shake hands to close a business deal. They buy a treadmill in order to exercise. But the commitment doesn't end with that decision. It's just getting started. And you better believe that any time you make a commitment to something, it will be tested. That happens in any number of ways. Experiencing failure. Perhaps the greatest challenge to commitment is failure. Olympic gold medalist Mary Lou Retton says, Achieving that goal is a good feeling, but to get there, you have to also get through the failures. You've got to be able to pick yourself up and continue. Having to stand alone. When you want to accomplish something, people will try to distract you. They will challenge you. They may even try to get you to compromise your values. It may be unintentional. It may be because they're worried that if you grow, they will feel left behind. In those moments, you need to ask yourself, who am I trying to please? If you desire to please yourself by following through on your commitments to yourself, there will be times that you need to stand alone. Facing Deep Disappointment Let's be honest, a lot of things can go wrong in life. How are you going to react in the face of those disappointments? Sportscaster Harry Callis once introduced Philadelphia Phillies outfielder Gary Maddox by saying, Gary has turned his life around. He used to be depressed and miserable. Now he's miserable and depressed. That's not how you want to end up. I don't think I really understood the true value of commitment until 1976. I was the senior pastor of one of the fastest-growing churches in Ohio, 
and the success we were seeing necessitated a $1 million expansion on our facilities. But there was a problem. I was only 29 years old, and I had never led a major building program. Frankly, the task seemed impossible. But at the same time, the future of the church absolutely depended on its success. That's when I made a life decision concerning commitment. If something is worth doing, I will commit myself to carrying it through. Little did I realize how much that commitment would be tested. Each time we made a decision, more problems arose. For example, to accommodate growth, I need to improve my staff. That meant terminating some people who were very popular. And more than 200 people in the church, nearly 15%, left because they did not agree with the vision. If you desire to have greater tenacity to accomplish the things you desire, then make the decision to embrace commitment wholeheartedly in your life. Begin by doing the following. Count the cost. After the Nazis drove the British Army from the European continent at Dunkirk and obtained France's surrender in June of 1940, the Germans were certain that victory in Europe was at hand and that Great Britain would seek a peace agreement. France also believed that that was true. French General Maxine Wagen told Charles de Gaulle, who was a colonel at the time, When I've been beaten here, England won't wait a week before negotiating with the right. But the Germans and the French underestimated the commitment of Winston Churchill, who had become England's Prime Minister in May, and of the British people. Churchill knew what was at stake in the conflict, as evidenced by his remarks at the time. What General Wagen called the Battle of France is over. I expect that the Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Upon it depends our own British life. Hitler knows that he will have to break us in this island or lose the war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be free. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and cared for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties, and so bear ourselves that, if the British Empire and its commonwealth Last for a thousand years, men will say, this was their finest hour. The war that England fought was long and bloody. They suffered terrible bombing from the Nazis, and for a long time they stood alone. But they stood. Their commitment was unwavering. And because they stood, the Allies won the war. I believe their resolve was strong not only because they knew what was at stake, but they also had a sense of what price they were being asked to pay. It can be very difficult to stand by a commitment naively made. The commitment becomes much stronger when you have already counted the cost. Determined to pay the price When I went off to college, I was determined to stay committed and focused on preparing for ministry. But I knew there would be a price. Many of my college friends got married while still in school, and some even had children. Margaret and I waited despite our shared desire to begin our married life. It was a difficult journey, and to this day I don't recommend engagements as long as ours. But our commitment paid off. A few weeks after we graduated, we got married, and we waited several years before having children. As a result, I was prepared when I entered the ministry, and I could focus on establishing my career during those important early years. Always strive for excellence. Anyone who desires to achieve and become successful must be like a fine craftsman, Committed to excellence. A great craftsman wants you to inspect his work, to look closely at its finest details. In contrast, sloppy people hide their work, and if anyone finds fault with it, shoddy workers find fault with their tools. Which are you most like? Excellence means doing your very best in everything and every way. That kind of commitment will take you where half-hearted people will never go. After I made the decision to commit myself to the building program at my church, I knew that I would need to find a way to keep myself on track. So I determined to live out this discipline. Every day I will renew my commitment and think about the benefits that come from it. To do that, I carried a laminated card with me every day for 18 months. Here's what was written on it. 
The moment one definitely commits oneself, then providence moves too. All sorts of things occur to help one that would never otherwise have occurred. A whole stream of events issue from the decision, raising in one's favor all manner of unforeseen incidents and meetings and material assistance which no man would have dreamed would come his way. William H. Murray I read that card every day as we were going through the project. It helped me to stay focused and feel encouraged. I thought, if I stay committed and do all I can, and then I ask God to make up the difference, we can achieve this. And we did. As you strive to keep your commitments daily, keep the following in mind. Expect commitment to be a struggle. When our children were young and living at home, Margaret and I decided one summer that we wanted to take them on a vacation that focused on how the United States was built as a nation. We started out in New York City. We went to Ellis Island, the longtime gateway into the country, and got a feel for the millions of immigrants who came to America with the dream of building a better life. We visited Philadelphia. We saw the room where our country became a nation with the signing of the Declaration of Independence. We viewed the Liberty Bell. And we visited the graves of the brave men who signed the Declaration of Independence. After that, we traveled south to Williamsburg, Virginia, the home of Patrick Henry, who declared, Give me liberty or give me death. And we ended the trip in Washington, D.C. As we looked up at the towering Washington Monument, we were reminded of the United States' struggle to become a nation. As we gazed at the huge statue of Lincoln at his memorial, we recalled the struggle we had endured to remain a nation. Everywhere we went, we were confronted with the commitment of men and women who founded and preserved our country. We learned about the risks they took, the battles they fought, the sacrifices they made. The greatest honors were reserved for those who endured the greatest struggles. The stakes were high, but so were the rewards. We still enjoy the freedom they won for us. That trip taught a great lesson to our family. Anything worth having is going to be a struggle. Commitment doesn't come easy, but when you're fighting for something you believe in, the struggle is worth it. Focus on choices, not conditions. In general, people approach daily commitment in one of two ways. They focus on the external or the internal. Those who focus on the external expect conditions to determine whether they keep their commitments. Because conditions are transitory, their commitment level changes like the wind. In contrast, people who base their actions on the internal focus on their choices. Each choice is a crossroad, one that will either confirm or compromise their commitments. When you come to a crossroad, you can recognize it because a personal decision is required, the decision will cost you something, and others will likely be influenced by it. Do what's right even when you don't feel like it. Thomas A. Buckner said, To bring oneself to a frame of mind and to the proper energy to accomplish things that require plain hard work continuously is the one big battle that everyone has. When this battle is won for all time, then everything is easy. One of the things I admire about great athletes is their understanding of this truth. That's one of the reasons I enjoy watching the Olympics. When the Olympic athletes come into the stadium during the opening ceremonies and prepare to participate in the games, one of the things they do is recite the following. I have prepared. I have followed the rules. I will not quit. Anyone who can say that with integrity can be proud of him or herself no matter what happens afterward. I believe my commitment continues to be a key to life. That's true in my marriage, my career, my spiritual life. There's not an area that it doesn't touch. Twenty-eight years after settling the commitment issue in my life, I look back and realize the importance of that decision. In my twenties, my commitment made up for my inexperience. In my thirties, my commitment motivated many to follow my leadership. In my 40s, my commitment kept me going during my most difficult leadership years. And in my 50s, my commitment has pushed me out of my comfort zone and into my productivity zone.
Recently, I read a story that exemplifies commitment. In 1999, the New York Times began awarding college scholarships in a program open to New York high school seniors. The stated goal was to support the aspirations of students who hoped to build on their achievements in college and to make significant contributions to society. The administrators of the program wanted especially to help students who had succeeded despite the odds. When the names and stories of the first recipients were announced, there were many great success stories. But one in particular stood out, the story of Liz Murray. Liz grew up in the Bronx, the child of two parents who were alcoholics and IV drug users. She says her parents always loved her, but they neglected her because of their preoccupation with drugs. Once she woke up to find that they had sold her sister's winter coat to get money for a fix. So to keep herself and her sister fed, she worked from the time she was nine years old. She offered to pump gas at self-service gas stations and bag groceries at stores for tips. It wasn't until Liz was in junior high school that she realized most kids didn't have parents who shot up cocaine in the living room. That was around the same time her mother's AIDS, which had been diagnosed a few years earlier, became acute. Liz wasn't going to school much by then. A lot of her time she tried to take care of her mother, who was also schizophrenic. The rest of her time she spent on the street and with friends. When Liz was fifteen, her mother died, and Liz became homeless. Ironically, that experience had a positive impact on her. When she saw her mother buried in a pauper's grave, Liz had a realization, and that brought her to a decision. She says, I connected the lifestyles that I had witnessed every day with how my mother ended up, and if there was anything that I could do about it, that would not happen to me. So I wanted to get back into school, but mind you, I was homeless. Her circumstances were dire, but she committed herself to the task. First, she found a summer job. Her employer and co-workers never knew that she was homeless. Her pay was based entirely on commission, and she excelled. That helped her scrape together enough money to survive. Then she got herself accepted at Humanities Preparatory Academy, a public high school in Manhattan. To make up for lost time, she did four years of coursework and two years by taking ten classes at a time. By day she went to school, by night she studied in the stairwells, and often rode subway trains until morning. She set her sights high. She had visited Harvard on a school trip. She decided to apply there and to apply for the New York Times scholarship. Since her mother's death, she had gained tenacity and focus. Her death showed me how short life is, said Liz, something I remind myself of dozens of times a day. Thinking of this, it's easy to prioritize in any difficult situation. It's always the people I care about that matter, and also working to bring out all the potential inside of me is a way of loving the people close to me the best I can. The interviews for Harvard and the scholarship fell on the same day. On that day, she also had an appointment at a welfare office to keep her meager benefits coming. As she waited in line, she saw her opportunity to get to the interviews ticking away. In frustration, she asked if she could be bumped to the front of the line because of her interview with Harvard. She was told, right, and the lady in front of you has an interview with Yale. Sit down. She walked away from her benefits and chose to go to the interviews. In the end, she made her interviews and her grades. She was awarded a yearly $12,000 scholarship, and she was accepted at Harvard. She has since transferred to Columbia. She says it's a better fit for her, and she can be closer to her father. Her story has been picked up by news programs. Lifetime made it into a movie, and she's currently writing it in a book format. She inspires everyone she meets. Her father, who is HIV positive and currently living drug-free, says that she is his hero. But Liz takes it all in stride. When asked about her philosophy, she summed it up this way. There's always a way through things if you work hard enough and look close. It all depends on your level of determination. Hard work and determination. That sounds like a good description of commitment.
Decision number seven. Today's finances give me options. O'Donnell Olson quips that the average American is busy buying things he doesn't want with money he doesn't have to impress people he doesn't like. There isn't an aspect of life that financial matters don't touch, and when people don't handle finances well day to day, it causes huge problems. Take a look at three simple truths about finances. Number one, money won't make you happy. Even though most people would say they agree with the saying "money won't buy happiness," they sometimes act as if they think is true. Why else would they make money such a high priority or compromise their values to get it? As a young man, I may have suspected that people with money were happier than people without it, but as I began counseling people with above-average incomes, I found that they had no advantage over people with low incomes. Automaker Henry Ford said, "Money doesn't change men; it merely unmasks them. If a man is naturally selfish or arrogant or greedy, the money brings it out. That's all. You are what you are, no matter how much or how little money you have." Number two, debt will make you unhappy. Having money may not make people happy, but owing money is sure to make them miserable. Novelist Samuel Butler, who satirized the Victorian life in England, wrote, "All progress is based upon a universal, innate desire, on the part of every living organism, to live beyond its income. Yet the truth is that if your outgo exceeds your income, then your upkeep will be your downfall." Number three, having a financial margin gives you options. The bottom line is that money is nothing but a tool. It is good for helping one achieve goals, but the goal of getting money for its own sake is ultimately hollow. If you have very little money, you have fewer choices. If you want to live where it's most convenient to your job, you may not be able to. If you lack money, you may not be able to send your children to the school you want. You may not be able to afford a reliable car. You may not be able to take off time from work to see your children's ball games or recitals. You may not be able to switch careers to something you love. You may live every month from paycheck to paycheck, and you may not be able to stop working when you're sixty-five, seventy, or even older. When I was growing up, it was obvious very early that my brother Larry and I had very different attitudes toward money. We were complete opposites. As a kid, all Larry wanted to do was work and make money. All I wanted to do was play with my friends. He spent his summers working. I spent my summers shooting hoops. He saved his money. I had nothing to save. When Larry was 16 years old, he bought himself a nice car with his own money, a four-year-old Ford. I didn't have a car until I graduated from college, and it was a beat-up Ford Falcon. And guess from whom I borrowed the money to buy it? From Larry and from my younger sister Trish. When I was studying for the ministry, I realized I was choosing a profession. Where I would not make a lot of money, I didn't mind that because I was doing what I believed I was called to do and what would be personally fulfilling. But I also recognized that when a person has no money, he has few options. In 1985, Margaret and I made a decision: we will sacrifice today so that we can have options tomorrow. From then on, we've determined to live by this financial formula: 10% to church and charity. Ten percent to investments, eighty percent to living expenses. Put yourself in position to make a good decision concerning finances by doing the following: put the value of things into perspective. To know whether your attitude about money and possessions is what it should be, ask yourself: one, am I preoccupied with things? Two, am I envious of others? Three, do I find my personal value in possessions? Four, do I believe that money will make me happy? And five, do I continually want more? If you answered yes to one or more of these questions, you need to do some soul searching. Materialism is a mindset. There's nothing wrong with possessing money or nice things. Likewise, there's nothing wrong with living modestly. Materialism is not about possession; it's an obsession. I've known materialistic people with no money and non-materialistic people who possess lots of money. Haven't you? 
Recognize your season of life. Every phase of life isn't the same, nor should we try to make it that way. Ideally, a person's life should follow a pattern where the main focus goes from learning to earning to returning. Here's what I mean about each phase. Learn. When you're young, your focus should be on exploring your talents, discovering your purpose, and learning your trade. Earn. If you're on track with your purpose, you've learned your trade well, and you practice it with excellence. The hope is that you will be able to earn a good living. Return. We should always try to be generous no matter our age, but if you've worked hard and planned well, you may enter a phase of life that is most rewarding, where you can focus on giving back to others. Reduce your debt. Michael Kidwell and Steve Rode, authors of Get Out of Debt, Smart Solutions to Your Money Problems, believe every person in debt is suffering from some type of depression. Debt is one of the leading causes of divorce, lack of sleep, and poor work performance. It is truly one of the deep, dark secrets that people have. It robs them of their self-worth and keeps them from achieving dreams. Kidwell and Rode suggest five steps to reduce debt. 1. Stop incurring debt. 2. Track your cash. 3. Plan for the future. 4. Don't expect instant miracles. 5. Seek professional help. Don't let your possessions or your lifestyle possess you. If you're a slave to debt, find a way to free yourself. I'm still growing in the discipline of finances. I settled my personal financial issue years ago with 10 10 80. But it's been only in the last decade that I have learned to be better at finances in business. I used to focus on the vision of the organization, hire the best leaders I could find to join me in achieving it, and then lead to the best of my ability. I pretty much left the financial aspects of the business to others. But my brother Larry took me to task for that attitude. He told me that I had no right to neglect business finances just because it wasn't an area of strength or passion for me. So now, at home and in business, I maintain this discipline. Every day I will focus on my financial game plan so that each day I will have more, not fewer, options. The earlier you make the decision and practice the discipline of sound financial management, the more options you will have. To help you approach your finances every day with the right attitude, do the following. Number one, become a good earner. To become a good financial manager, you must first have something to manage. That's why I believe the first discipline of finances is to maximize your earning potential. By that, I don't mean to neglect the other important areas of life in order to make a buck, nor am I suggesting that your focus should always be on money. Just maintain a strong work ethic and learn how to make and manage money. Develop relationships with people who are successful in this area and learn from them. There are also plenty of good books about personal and business finances. Number two, be grateful every day. One of the most important things you can do for yourself is keep your perspective and be thankful for whatever you have. Poet Rudyard Kipling once told his audience while speaking at a graduation ceremony, Do not pay too much attention to fame, power, or money. Someday you will meet a person who cares for none of these, and then you will know how poor you are. Number three, don't compare yourself to others. If you see your neighbors buying new furnishings for their homes, taking elaborate vacations, and driving a new vehicle every year, does something stir inside you to do the same? Just because someone appears to be in similar circumstances to you doesn't mean anything. Your neighbors might earn twice as much as you do, or they may be in debt up to their eyeballs and three-fourths of their way to bankruptcy court. Don't make assumptions, and don't try to be like someone else. As I look back at my life in light of finances, I realize that my thinking has changed over the years, as I've gotten more mature and more realistic. In my 20s, I realized that life consisted of more than money. In my 30s, I realized that money would give me options. In my 40s, I realized that I needed to pay now in order to play later. 
In my 50s, I realized that the greatest joy in making money is the privilege of giving it away. Decision number eight. Today's faith gives me peace. Knowing my background, you're probably not surprised that faith is one of my daily dozen. My faith is the most important thing in my life, but I'm very sensitive to the fact that others may have a very different point of view, and I never push my faith on anyone. I want to be sensitive to your views concerning faith. Therefore, I will share with you my personal spiritual journey with the hope that it will encourage you to explore this aspect of your own life. I sincerely believe that faith holds the key to life's meaning. Consider a few of the things faith does. Faith gives me a divine perspective today. There are a lot of things in life that are difficult to understand. Faith allows the soul to go beyond what the eyes can see, or, to put it another way, as author Philip Yancey says, faith is trusting in advance what will only make sense in reverse. If you're a parent, then you already understand how this works. When children are small, they ask a lot of questions. Sometimes we tell them something, and their life experience doesn't provide them with what they need to grasp it. It's like trying to explain to a three-year-old that if he falls into a swimming pool when no one is around, he'll drown. But why, he asks, how do you know? You try to explain, but at some point all you can say is, you just have to trust me on this. Faith gives me health today. Years ago, I read about a study from Purdue University that found people who practice their religion regularly develop only half as many medical problems as non-believers. The researchers concluded that religion kept people stressed down and their sense of well-being up because their faith added meaning and perspective as well as valuable social networks. Faith gives me strength for today. A strong faith of any kind gives a person strength. Few things can help a person overcome adversity the way that faith can. S.G. Holland, former Prime Minister of New Zealand, asserted that faith draws the poison from every grief, takes the sting from every loss, and quenches the fire of every pain, and only faith can do it. Faith gives a person power. I grew up in a household filled with faith. My father, Melvin, became a pastor as a young man and remains in ministry to this day at age 83. I heard words of faith from him and my mother, Lara, every day growing up. But you can't live on someone else's faith. There are no spiritual grandchildren. Each person must make his own decision and act on it with integrity. At age 17, I made my faith decision. I will accept God's gift of His Son, Jesus Christ, as my Savior. That decision, more than any other, has shaped my life. It has forged my worldview. Recognition of God's love for everyone has influenced how I view others. The golden rule has taught me how to treat people. God's love for me has given me great self-worth. And the Bible has taught me how to lead people. Whenever I am asked to sign a copy of the Maxwell Leadership Bible, the edition that contains leadership notes from my 30 years of studying leadership in Scripture, I write, Everything I know about leadership, I learn from this book. If you desire to make an honest exploration of faith, then know this. We already have faith. The important choice is where we place it. Author John Bassagno observed, Faith is at the heart of life. You go to a doctor whose name you cannot pronounce. He gives you a prescription you cannot read. You take it to a pharmacist you have never seen. He gives you a medicine you do not understand, and yet you take it. We all have faith. Every day we act on beliefs that have little or no evidence to back them up. That is also true in a spiritual sense. Just as one person has faith that God is real, an atheist has faith that there is no God. Both people hold strong beliefs, and neither person can produce evidence to absolutely prove his point of view. Right now, you already have faith in something. Your goal should be to align your beliefs with the truth. Seek the truth, and I believe you will find it. A faith that hasn't been tested can't be trusted. 
Perhaps nothing in recent history tested the faith of so many people as severely as the Holocaust. Viennese psychiatrist Viktor Frankl was one of the survivors of the Nazi atrocities. He spent 1942 to 1945 in the concentration camps of Auschwitz and Dachau. Frankl once said, A weak faith is weakened by predicaments and catastrophes, whereas a strong faith is strengthened by them. Despite the horrors he witnessed and the treatment he suffered, his faith didn't weaken. It deepened. Thousands of books have been written on how to live out the disciplines of faith. Perhaps that is so because it is such a difficult thing to do. For me, the discipline can be captured in one simple phrase. Every day to live and lead like Jesus. While the words are simple, following through is not. Living out the discipline of faith is the greatest challenge of my daily dozen. The problem is that instead of being like Jesus, I often want to be like John Maxwell. I fall short of the mark, but with God as my helper, I keep growing. When I do follow in His footsteps and live His principles, people are helped and I am fulfilled. Following are four suggestions for managing your discipline of faith. Number one, embrace the value of faith. There are some things in life you will arrive at only through faith. In the past, many people hoped that science would provide all the answers to life's questions. But science cannot do that. Ironically, what is embraced as scientific fact changes from generation to generation. Just look at the way scientists have viewed our solar system. Ptolemy believed the earth was at its center. Copernicus asserted that the sun was at its center and the planets moved in circular orbits around it. Kepler proved that the orbits were elliptical. Today, scientists no longer argue the structure of the solar system, but ideas on how it was formed change continually. Contrast science with faith. The core beliefs of Judaism and Christianity have not changed in thousands of years. There is a spiritual aspect to human life that cannot be denied. Spiritual needs must be met spiritually. Nothing else can fill the void. Number two, put God in the picture. If you want to embrace faith, you must let God into your life. No one else is worthy of our absolute and unconditional trust. Theologian F. B. Meyer said, Unbelief puts our circumstances between us and God. Faith puts God between us and our circumstances. Who wouldn't like to have the Creator of the universe helping them? James, one of the fathers of the first century church, advised, Come near to God, and He will come near to you. Number three, explore and deepen your faith. D.L. Moody, a 19th century lay preacher who founded Northfield Seminary and the Moody Bible Institute, explained how his faith developed. He said, I prayed for faith and thought that someday faith would come down and strike me like lightning. But faith did not seem to come. One day I read in the 10th chapter of Romans, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I had closed my Bible and prayed for faith. I now open my Bible and begin to study, and faith has been growing ever since. St. Augustine of Hippo observed, Faith is to believe what we do not see, and the reward of this faith is to see what we believe. When I made my faith decision back in 1964, I knew at the time I was doing the right thing for myself spiritually. But I didn't know that I would see what I believe play out so dramatically in my life. In my teens, my faith gave me assurance of eternal salvation. In my twenties, my faith gave me meaning and fulfillment. In my thirties, my faith gave me a platform to help others. In my forties, my faith gave me a foundation for my leadership. And in my fifties, my faith gave me a peace that cannot be given by others or taken away by them. I cannot imagine how my life would have played out without my faith at the center of it. Ever since he was a kid, Rick Husband wanted to be an astronaut. He remembered seeing his first space launch at age four, and he was fascinated by the Gemini and the Apollo missions. Patty Reagan, a friend whose family had been close to the Husbands for three generations, said, Rick wanted to be an astronaut from the time he was in the fourth grade, and he did everything he needed to do that. When Husband went off to college at Texas Tech, 
He studied mechanical engineering and became a member of the Air Force ROTC. He completed undergraduate pilot training and then began his career as an F-4 fighter pilot in the Air Force. Before long, he became a flight instructor and then a test pilot. As a program manager, he helped work on an increased performance engine. He became an F-15 demonstration pilot, and he participated in a pilot exchange program with the RAF. In all, he had logged more than 3,800 hours of flight time in more than 40 different kinds of aircraft. He was among the best of the best. Along the way, not only did he earn his master's degree in mechanical engineering from Cal State Fresno, but he also got married and had two children. He was respected not only for his skill in his career, but also for his faith and his devotion as a husband and a father. In December of 1994, husband finally realized his dream of becoming an astronaut and began training a few months later. In 1999, he went into space for the first time as pilot of the Space Shuttle Discovery, and he loved it. One of the most enjoyable things about flying in space is getting to see God's creation from a different perspective, said husband. There are just so many different beautiful aspects of the views you get to see out there that it is an awe-inspiring sight, almost no matter in which direction you're looking. Husband's next trip into space was aboard the Columbia, and this time he commanded the mission. As usual, his family watched the launch in Florida. That was always the most nerve-wracking time. When Rick's wife, Evelyn, described it, she said that the worst is, in the first couple of minutes because of the Challenger, when I saw the rocket boosters come off, that pretty much does it for me because I feel like we're home free. Little did anyone suspect that the real danger would be when Columbia was making its final descent to land at Kennedy Space Center. On February 1, 2003, at about 9 a.m., the Space Shuttle Columbia disintegrated over the Dallas-Fort Worth area, just a few hundred miles from where Rick Husband grew up. The entire crew of seven was lost. Just two days after the tragedy, Evelyn Husband was interviewed by Katie Corrick on the Today Show. She was remarkably composed. She talked about how the families of all Columbia's astronauts had come together to comfort one another, how they were grieving together, and how supportive NASA had been. She expressed her desire that space exploration continue. And she also explained how she was making it through a difficult time. When Rick autographed pictures for people, he always put a Bible verse on it that was Proverbs 3, 5 through 6, which says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. And that verse has been a blessing to me and Rick, and now it's a tremendous blessing to me because I don't understand any of this, but I do trust the Lord, and so that's been a tremendous comfort. If you desire to have the kind of peace that Evelyn Husband has and the assurance that she and Rick enjoyed, then make a faith decision and learn to deepen and live out your faith daily. Decision number nine. Today's relationships give me fulfillment. Think back to the most important experiences of your life, the highest highs, the greatest victories, the most daunting obstacles overcome. How many happen to you alone? I'll bet there are very few. When you understand that being connected to others is one of life's greatest joys, you realize that life's best comes when you initiate and invest in solid relationships. You'll enjoy life more if you like people. Of the people you know which seem to have the most fun in life, think about them a moment. Would you describe them as negative, suspicious, surly, and antisocial? Of course not. When have you known someone with those characteristics who loved life and had a lot of fun? The Scrooges of life don't enjoy much of anything. On the other hand, people who love people usually have a ball. If you like people, then no matter where you go, you'll meet a friend. You'll get farther in life if people like you. Consultant John Luther observes, natural talent, intelligence, a wonderful education— None of these guarantees success. Something else is needed. The sensitivity to understand what other people want and the willingness to give it to them. Worldly success depends on pleasing others, 
No one is going to win fame, recognition, or advancement just because he or she thinks it's deserved. Someone else has to think so, too. There's an old saying in sales, All things being equal, the likable person wins. But all things not being equal, the likable person still wins. There's no substitute for relational skill when it comes to getting ahead in any aspect of life. People are any organization's most appreciable asset. There are plenty of personal reasons to cultivate positive relationships, but there are also other practical ones. Any organization that succeeds does so because of its people. It doesn't matter whether it's a business, sports team, church, or society. Organizationally, you live or die with your people. That's why Jim Collins, author of From Good to Great, writes about the importance of recruiting, or as he calls it, getting the right people on the bus. When I was in my early teens, my father encouraged me to read How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. I've always remembered the advice that the Master of Relationships gave in the book. In order to make friends, one must first be friendly. I determined to be more intentional and take relationships to a new level in my life. That's when I made the relationship decision. I will initiate and make an investment in relationships with others. To have the kind of solid relationships that bring fulfillment, you have to change your mindset when it comes to dealing with others. Here are some ways that you can do that. Place a high value on people. Let's face it. If you don't care about people, you are unlikely to make building good relationships a priority in your life. What one-time National Salesman of the Year, Les Giblin, said is true. You can't make the other fellow feel important in your presence if you secretly feel that he is a nobody. The solution is to place a high value on people. Expect the best from everyone. Assume people's motives are good unless they prove them to be otherwise. Value them by their best moments, and give them your friendship rather than asking for theirs. That will ultimately be their decision. Learn to understand people. If you desire to improve your understanding of people so that you can build positive relationships, then keep in mind the following truths about people and actions you can take to bridge the gap often caused by them. People are insecure. Give them confidence. People want to feel special. Sincerely compliment them. People desire a better tomorrow. Show them hope. People need to be understood. Listen to them. People are selfish. Speak to their needs first. People get emotionally low. Encourage them. And people want to be associated with success. Help them win. When you understand people, don't take their shortcomings personally, and help them to succeed, you lay the groundwork for good relationships. To keep me on track in my relationships so that I'm investing in them as I must to make them successful, I practice this discipline. Every day I make the conscious effort to deposit goodwill into my relationships with others. Every evening I evaluate this area of my life by asking myself, have I been thoughtful toward people today? Would they express joy that they have spent time with me? If the answer is yes, then I've done my part. If you want to improve your relationships through your everyday actions, then do the following. Put others first. The most basic way to put others first is to practice the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you take that mindset into all your relationships with others, you can't go wrong. Don't carry emotional baggage. Few things weigh as much as old hurts and offenses carried day after day in a person's life. If you want to enjoy your time with other people, you've got to get rid of that kind of stuff. You can't keep score of old wrongs and expect to make relationships right. If someone has hurt you and you need to address it and get it out onto the table, then do it right away. Resolve it and get beyond it. If it's not worth bringing up, forget about it and move on. Give time to your most valuable relationships. Most people give away their relational energy on a first-come, first-served basis. Whoever gets their attention first gobbles up their time and relational energy. 
That's why the squeaky wheels, instead of the high producers at work, consume so much attention and why so many people have nothing left to give when they get home from work. You already know that I believe your family provides the most valuable relationships in your life. They should come first as you plan to spend your time. After that should come your next most important relationships. It's a matter of practicing good priorities. As I grow older, what I cherish most is my relationships. I've been very fortunate in this area of life for a long time. Over a two-year period, when I was in my twenties, I was best man in eight weddings. I can't count the number of friends I have. I enjoy a great marriage. I've built relationships that have lasted for decades. Every week, my assistant receives a call from someone who describes himself as my best friend. And every day, I receive emails from people I love. As I look back, I realize that in my twenties, my relationships filled my days with joy. In my thirties, my relationships gave me wisdom and insight. In my forties, my relationships lifted me to a higher level. And in my fifties, my relationships provide me with wonderful memories. Has someone who is bigger, faster, and better than you ever come alongside of you and taken an interest in you? That's what Dr. Bill Bright, the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, did for me. In my circles, he was a legend. He's what I call a level five leader, someone who's larger than life, a leader people follow because of who he is and what he represents. In the 1950s, he and his wife, Annette, made a declaration that they would become slaves for the sake of their faith, and they have lived out that commitment. His worldwide organization has nearly 13,000 employees and more than 10,000 trained volunteers. He has been awarded the Templeton Prize for the Advancement of Religion. Billy Graham called him a man whose sincerity and integrity and devotion to our Lord have been an inspiration and a blessing to me ever since the early days of my ministry. Twenty years ago, Bill took me under his wing and became my mentor. He always made time for me. When I had leadership questions, he graciously answered them. He became a model of visionary leadership to me, challenging me to think bigger, to reach farther, to give more of myself but he was also my friend. He loved me and gave to me with absolutely no thought of getting anything in return. In 2001, I had the privilege of honoring Bill Bright at one of our conferences with a Catalyst Award for Lifetime Achievement for being a leader, pioneer, mentor, and friend of leaders for 50 years. He was very gracious when he accepted it. He received so many awards over the decades that it probably didn't mean much to him. But it was a big deal to me, especially since I knew he was dying. During the ceremony, I read a letter that I had composed and delivered to Bill after I received word that he was diagnosed with pulmonary fibrosis. I remember writing it on a plane and just weeping, and I was embarrassed when the flight attendant asked me if I was okay. I wanted to let Bill know how much he meant to me. In part, the letter said, Bill, the greatest deposit you have made in my life is your personal interest in me. Often you have said with affection, my dear John. Each time those words have touched my heart. It was your belief in me that placed me on a program of a conference in 1983. And as I sat beside Lloyd Ogilvie, Ray Stedman, Chuck Swindoll, John Stott, Chuck Colson, and you, I realized this 37-year-old kid was way over his head. Why would you pick me out of a crowd of leaders in South Korea and ask me to ride in your car in the motorcade? You honored me when I was asked to speak at your international conference. You lifted me to a higher level when you wrote a chapter in my prayer partner book. Over the years, I have benefited from your notes, phone calls, and personal encouragement. But my greatest moment with you was after lunch we shared together in the late 80s, when I felt the load of leadership and you asked me to kneel beside you. That day, as I knelt beside you, you laid hands on me and you prayed for God to strengthen me. We embraced, and God did answer your prayer. In March of 2003, I was surprised by a note I received from Bill. In it, he invited me to take his place as chairman of Global Pastors Network, an organization he founded to equip leaders around the world. He said, I would like to bestow upon you a worldwide mantle of leadership to touch and train more than 10 million pastors in the next 10 years. 
My desire is that God would catapult you further than you have ever dreamed possible in your lifetime. It was a great privilege. Not only was he giving me an opportunity to make a difference in the lives of so many people, but he was giving me a chance to give back for all that he had given to me. On July 19, 2003, Bill Bright died. I am grateful that I got to see him six days before he passed away to say goodbye. I'll miss him. But with his passing, the overwhelming emotion I feel isn't sadness, it's fulfillment. The relationship I had with him is one of the great joys of my life. And I think back to the words of my psychology professor, Dr. David Van Hoos, from four decades ago, who said, If you have one true friend in life, you are very fortunate. I know I am fortunate indeed. Decision number 10. Today's generosity gives me significance. If your income doubled overnight, how much money would you give away? How about if your net worth were suddenly over $100 million? What if you became the richest person in the world? How generous do you think you would be? Don't you have the right to keep whatever money you earn, or inherit for that matter? Of course you do. But what you have the right to do isn't the point. What would it be best for you to do? Why should we be generous? I believe there are many reasons, but here are just three. Number one, giving turns your focus outward. No one likes to be around people who think only of themselves. In contrast, nearly everyone enjoys being around people who are giving. Biographer and literary critic Van Wick Brooks stated, How delightful is the company of generous people! who overlook trifles and keep their minds instinctively fixed on whatever is good and positive in the world around them. People of small caliber are always caring. They are bent on showing their own superiority, their knowledge or prowess or good breeding. But magnanimous people have no vanity, they have no jealousy, they have no reserves, and they feed on the true and the solid wherever they find it. And what is more? They find it everywhere. Number two, giving adds value to others. One of the most significant things a person can do while on this earth is help others. In this life, the measure of a person isn't the number of people who serve him or the amount of money he amasses. It's how many people he serves. The greater your giving, the greater your living. U.S. President Woodrow Wilson said it this way, You are not here merely to make a living. You are here in order to enable the world to live more amply, with greater vision, with a finer spirit of home and achievement. You are here to enrich the world, and you impoverish yourself if you forget the errand. No one stands taller in the climb to success than when he bends over to help someone else up. Number three, giving helps the giver. Doesn't it make you feel good when you do something for another person? Don't you feel especially rewarded when the person's need is acute? Ruth Smeltzer said, You have not lived a perfect day, even though you have earned your money, unless you have done something for someone who will never be able to repay you. That's one of the reasons many people rush to help when tragedy strikes. When people suffer because of earthquakes, famine, hurricanes, or war, givers are moved to help, and they never expect to receive anything in return. When my wife Margaret and I started our life together, in the weeks after our wedding, we moved to Hillham, Indiana, where I took my first job. The church that hired me was able to pay only $80 a week, so Margaret worked several jobs to help us make ends meet. Those days were very difficult for us financially, yet they were still filled with great joy. At that time, my brother Larry was tasting early success in the business world and was doing very well financially. Larry and his wife Anita saw that we were struggling, and for those first few years they were very generous to us. The only vacations we had were ones they invited us on and paid for. All my good clothes were the result of their generosity. Larry paid my expenses as I worked on a business degree. We will always be grateful to them. As I look back on those days, three thoughts are clear to me. First, Margaret and I were never jealous of Larry and Anita's financial success. We were thrilled for them, and not once did we covet what they had. 
Second, we could see that their generous spirit was a tremendous source of joy for them and a blessing for us. Third, it was then, in 1970, that I realized the incredible value of having a generous lifestyle toward others. That's when I made another of my life decisions. I will live to give. Margaret and I recognize that greatness is not defined by what a person receives, but by what a person gives. True generosity isn't a function of income. It begins with the heart. It's about serving others and looking for ways to add value to them. That's the way to achieve significance in your life. If you desire to become generous and make generosity part of your daily life, then do the following. Give others your money. The way people handle money colors their attitude about many other aspects of their lives. Wherever your money is, that's where your attention goes. Haven't you found that to be true? If you invest heavily in the stock market, you probably check the financial page or your earning statements frequently. If you spend a large amount of money on a house, you probably spend a lot of time and effort taking care of it. If you give a lot of money to a church or favorite charity, you care how the money is used and whether the organization succeeds. Give others yourself. What do people often value more than your money? The answer is your time and attention. Think about it. What takes greater effort, writing a check or giving your time? What shows the greater level of commitment? My friend Larry Burkett said, Where there is no giving, there is no commitment. A child desires to have a parent's undivided attention more than anything else. Even sharp employees with great potential understand that a good mentor is more valuable than a mere monetary reward. Money may buy stuff, but a good mentor buys a better future. When you give the gift of yourself, you are being as generous as you can be. It's very easy to live only for yourself. In fact, that may be every person's natural bent. I know it's mine, but we can take another path. To be generous. My desire is to be the kind of person I would like to be around. To help with that, I practiced this discipline, reminded myself every day I will add value to others. How do you do it? Here's how to start. Value people. This means treating everyone with respect. Know what people value. This means listening and seeking to understand others. Make myself more valuable. This means growing in order to give because I cannot give what I do not possess. And finally, do things that God values. Since He unconditionally loves people, so must I. I have a lot to be thankful for. As I look back and think about the idea of generosity, this is the pattern that emerges. In my twenties, generosity was modeled for me by my brother and many others. In my thirties, generosity became a priority in my life. In my forties, generosity became a joy in my life. In my fifties, my generosity has begun to return to me tenfold. Margaret and I have tried to be generous for the last thirty-plus years, and we have endeavored to plan our lives so that we can continue to be generous. What we do for ourselves alone dies with us, but what we do for others and the world remains and is immortal. Decision number 11. Today's values give me direction. While I was preparing to write this section, two notable things happened. Sam Waxel, former CEO of Imclone, who had pleaded guilty to securities fraud, bank fraud, conspiracy to obstruct justice and perjury, was sentenced to more than seven years in prison and ordered to pay nearly $4.3 in fines and back taxes. The other notable thing was that Martha Stewart, founder of Martha Stewart Living Omnimedia, and a friend of Waxel, was indicted on charges of securities fraud, obstruction of justice, conspiracy, and making false statements to prosecutors and the FBI. Unless you've had your head in the sand since the beginning of the new millennium, You've grown sick of hearing such stories. Enron admits to inflating its income figures by $586 million over a few years and files Chapter 11 bankruptcy. WorldCom admits to overstating profits by $7.1 billion, costing 17,000 workers their jobs and costing the company's stock 75% of its value. 
news breaks of the Catholic churches covering up improprieties by some priest. The list goes on and on. Every story reflects the incredible damage that can be done when individuals lose direction after failing to embrace and practice good values daily. George H. Loamer, one-time editor of the Saturday Evening Post, said, Back of every life there are principles that have fashioned it. Those principles that guide your life are your values. After all, a person's core values are nothing more than principles that he or she has internalized. And those core values are critical to success because they function as number 1. An anchor. People without values are adrift on the ocean of life. When the waves come crashing down, they have no place to rest. Any big storm can threaten to put them under. Any current is liable to take them places they don't want to go. However, when you have strong values, you have something that holds you steady, even when the weather gets nasty. Number two, a faithful friend. Because your core values are the deeply held beliefs that authentically describe your soul, they become a companion to you throughout your life. They can be very reassuring. U.S. President Abraham Lincoln said, When I lay down the reins of this administration, I want to have one friend left, and that friend is inside myself. Number three, your North Star. Once you have thoroughly examined your values and articulated them, you will be able to steer your life by them. You may add to your list as you become older and wiser, but if something is truly a core value, then it remains one for life. Over the years, I've taught a lot of lessons on values to leaders because values are critical to any kind of success. In preparing to write this book, I spent some time revisiting my own values. Now that I am in my fifties, I think I have finally created the list that will last me until the end of my life. I use that list to outline this book. I value my attitude because it gives me possibilities. I value my priorities because they give me focus. I value my health because it gives me strength. I value my family because it gives me stability. I value my thinking because it gives me an advantage. I value my commitment because it gives me tenacity. I value my finances because they give me options. I value my faith because it gives me peace. I value my relationships because they give me fulfillment. I value my generosity because it gives me significance. I value my values because they give me direction. And I value my growth because it gives me potential. With the guidance of those twelve values, I hope to fulfill the purpose of my life, which centers on three main areas. Number one, my family. To live a credible life so that my values are accepted by my family. Number two, my work. To influence as many people as possible in the shortest amount of time. And three, myself. To die with the satisfaction that I have served God, others, and my family. I grew up in a home where great values were taught and lived out, but I didn't make a conscious decision to embrace good values and live them out until 1970 when I was 23 years old. That year I read Spiritual Leadership by J. Oswald Sanders. It changed my life. It made me realize that I was not leading according to my values, and it gave me the courage to do the right thing, even if it wasn't popular. I made the decision. I will lead others based on the values I embrace. I still have my copy of Spiritual Leadership because it marked me. Inside the back cover, I wrote three commitments that would shape the rest of my life. The book challenged me to, number one, be God's man. No matter where my work takes me, I desire to be in the center of God's will. Two, to develop my potential to the best of my ability. I will never allow myself to be lazy, indifferent, or non-committal concerning spiritually lost people. And number three, to be a true spiritual leader. God is my idol, Jesus is my pattern, and the Bible provides my direction. I will not, with God's help, be poured into another man's mold or teach what I do not believe. Comedian Fred Allen said, You only live once, but if you work it right, once is enough. How can people work it right? 
by knowing their values and living by them every day. Do that and you will have few regrets at the end of your life. Here are some suggestions to help you get started. Managing your life according to your values isn't easy. Why? Because your values will be tested daily by those who do not embrace them. Negative people may discount you when you display a positive attitude. People without families may not understand your devotion to your family. Unteachable people won't understand your dedication to personal growth. And those whose priorities are different from yours will try to convince you to follow them or make unwise compromises. The discipline I practice to battle this is simple. Every day I review and reflect on my values. To help me do that, I keep a list of my daily dozen in my thinking companion, a little notebook I always keep with me so that I can write down ideas and jot down reminders of things to tell Margaret. Every time I open the notebook, I see those twelve values. To become better at embracing and practicing your values every day, follow these guidelines. Articulate and embrace your values daily. How do you manage something as abstract as your values? You begin by putting them in concrete form. Create your list of values and write a descriptive statement for each one explaining how you intend to apply it to your life and what benefit or direction that will bring. Keep that document where you can see it every day. Think about your values often to help them soak in. As you go through your day and face decisions, measure your choices against your values. And, whenever it's appropriate, talk about them. It not only cements your values in your mind and helps you to practice them, but it also adds a level of accountability. Compare your values to your practices daily. The gap between knowing and doing is significantly greater than the gap between ignorance and knowledge. A person who identifies and articulates his values but doesn't practice them is like a salesman who makes promises to a customer and then fails to deliver. He has no credibility. In business, the result is that the person loses his job. In life, the person loses his integrity. In 1995, Gary Shaw, an assistant controller for a division of a Fortune 500 company, was charged with embezzling $988,000 from the company over an eight-year period. He pleaded no contest in court, and he was prepared to repay $728,000 immediately and borrow additional money from relatives to repay the rest. The CEO of the company was outraged. To court officials, he wrote, I view Mr. Shaw's crime as particularly egregious. Not only did he steal from the stockholders of this Fortune 500 company, but he breached the fiduciary duty placed in him by the company and his supervisors. I urge you to impress upon Mr. Shaw and those others who commit similar crimes that wrongdoing of this nature against society is considered a grave matter by the Texas court and will not be condoned. You know what was ironic about that statement? It was made by Tyco CEO Dennis Kozlowski, the man later charged with looting $600 million from the same company with the help of two other executives. Evidently, this disconnection between his stated values and his practices was a pattern. Discrepancies between values and practices create chaos in a person's life. If you talk your values but neglect to walk them, then you will continually undermine your integrity and credibility. And that will happen even if you are unaware of your behavior and are not doing it intentionally. As I reflect on the values decision I made in 1970, I realize that it has provided me direction in my personal and professional life. In my 20s, my values gave me courage to do the right thing. In my thirties, my values motivated me to leave my comfort zone and take big steps professionally. In my forties, my values enabled me to have favor with other leaders. In my fifties, my values have given me great security. For thirty-four years, my values have provided a solid foundation on which I have built my life. Decision number twelve. Today's growth gives me potential. Novelist Robert Louis Stevenson said, 
To be what we are and to become what we are capable of becoming is the only end of life. Nearly all people would like to become who they are capable of being, yet I think many people don't. One reason is their misunderstanding of growth. They think growth is automatic. When we're children, our bodies grow automatically. Also during that time, there are adults such as our parents or teachers who challenge us to grow mentally on a daily basis. So we get used to growing. The problem comes when we stop growing physically and we get out of school. We expect our bodies to take care of themselves as they did the first 20 years of our lives. And we think our minds will take care of themselves too, even though we no longer have anyone pushing us to improve. The truth is, if we don't take responsibility for our growth, it won't happen. Growth is not automatic. If you believe it simply comes with age, you might turn out like the subject of singer and comedian Tennessee Ernie Ford's comment. He started out at the bottom and sort of likes it there. Personal growth works exactly opposite to compounding interest in a bank account. If someone deposited a sum of money into an account the day you were born, the way to make it grow is not to touch it. But when it comes to your potential, you must tap into it to make it grow. They think growth comes from information. The greatest obstacle to growth is not ignorance. It's the illusion of knowledge. Have you ever known someone who was a font of data, yet could do nothing with it to benefit himself or others? Individuals like that are similar to encyclopedias, filled with information, but useless when unused. Life change is the proper measure of whether information makes a difference. They think growth comes with experience. Gilbert Arlen said when an archer misses the mark, he turns and looks for the fault within himself. Failure to hit the bullseye is never the fault of the target. To improve your aim, improve yourself. A person who believes that growth comes simply as a result of experience is like an archer who keeps shooting arrows off target and believes he's improving because he keeps missing in the same place. Experience is good only if it's reflected on and one learns from both his mistakes and successes. Allow me to give you four specific reasons why growth matters today. Number one, gifting without growth leads to ineffectiveness. Missionary physician Albert Schweitzer said, The secret of success is to go through life as a man who never gets used up. How do you ensure that you will not get used up before your life is done? The answer comes in the way you approach talent. If you draw on your talent but never add to it or sharpen it, you're headed for trouble because nobody is that talented. But when you place a premium on growth, you take whatever talent you have and you increase it. That not only raises your effectiveness today, but it makes your talent greater so that you can be effective tomorrow. Number two. Growth prevents personal and professional stagnation. Have you ever felt that you were just stuck in some aspect of your life? You want to advance in your career, but you seem to have stalled. You desire to improve your relationship with your spouse, but you don't seem able to break new ground. Or you hit a plateau in your health, and nothing you do seems to advance your efforts. How do you overcome such stagnation? I'll tell you what a lot of people do. They make external changes. They look for a different job, leave their spouse, or give up exercising. The better solution is to pursue internal changes. You become better equipped to face career challenges. You discover new ways to relate to your spouse. You find ways to improve your eating or maximize your exercise. You gain the potential to break the stagnation and improve your situation without some of the losses of career changes broken relationships, or neglected health. Number three, your personal growth impacts your organization's growth. For years, I've taught leadership conferences for people who desire to grow their organizations, and i found that many leaders are looking for quick fixes to create growth. One of the things I've taught in those settings is that if you want to grow the organization, you must grow the leader. Business philosopher and author Jim Rohn puts it another way. In order to do more, I've got to be more. 
If you are growing, then your organization has a good chance to grow. Number four, only through continuous improvement can you reach your potential. The Tartar tribes of Central Asia spoke of a certain curse against an enemy. They didn't hurl words calling for their enemy's swords to rust or for their people to die of disease. Instead, they said, May you stay in one place forever. If you don't try to improve yourself every day, that could be your fate. You will be stuck in the same place, doing the same things, hoping the same hopes for coming years, but never gaining new territory or winning new victories. In 1974, a critical event occurred in my life that would change it forever. I met Kirk Kampmeyer of Success Motivation, Inc. for breakfast in Lancaster, Ohio. While we were eating, Kurt posed a question. John, he asked, what is your plan for personal growth? Never at a loss for words, I tried to find things in my life that might qualify for growth. I told him about the many activities I was engaged in throughout the week, and I went into a speech about how hard I worked and the gains I was making in my organization. I must have talked for ten minutes until I finally ran out of gas. Kurt listened patiently. But then he finally smiled and said, You don't have a personal plan for growth, do you? No, I finally admitted. You know, Kurt said simply, growth is not an automatic process. And that's when it hit me. I wasn't doing anything intentional or strategic to make myself better. And in that moment I made the decision. I will develop and follow a personal growth plan for my life. That night, I went home and talked to Margaret about my conversation with Kurt and what I had learned that day. I showed her the workbook and the tapes that Kurt was selling. I knew those resources could help us grow. They cost about $745, a huge sum for us at that time. We couldn't afford it. But we couldn't afford not to get it either. A couple of important things happened that night. First, we figured how to scrape together the money to buy the resources. It would require us to make sacrifices in our already tight budget for the next six months. But more important, Margaret and I made a commitment to grow together as a couple. From that day on, we learned together, we traveled together, and we sacrificed together in order to grow. It was a wise decision. While too many couples grow apart, we were growing together. If you're ready to make the decision to pursue growth and experience improvement every day, then do the following. Answer the question, what is my potential? I saw a story about a St. Louis doctor who met a young man in high school who had lost his hand at the wrist. When the doctor asked about his handicap, the teenager responded, I don't have a handicap, sir. I just don't have a right hand. The doctor later learned that the young man was one of the leading scorers on his high school football team. The greatest handicap a person has is not realizing his potential. What dreams do you have that are just waiting to be fulfilled? What gifts and talents are inside you that are dying to be drawn out and developed? The gap between your vision and your present reality can only be filled through a commitment to maximize your potential. Make a Commitment to Change Author William Feather said, The only thrill worthwhile is the one that comes from making something out of yourself. To make something out of yourself, you need to be willing to change, for without change, there can be no growth. The problem most people have is that they want things to stay the same yet also get better. Obviously, that can't happen. If you truly want to grow, then commit yourself to not only accepting change, but seeking it. Set Growth Goals When I first began going after personal growth using Kirk Kampmeyer's materials, I pursued a growth plan that was foundational rather than specific. That was okay then. I was in my mid-twenties and I was just getting started. But as I got older, more experienced, and further in my career, I started to focus my growth in a few key areas. One was communication. That made sense for me, not only because I spoke to audiences four or five times a week, but also because I had some natural ability in that area. Another area was leadership something I needed to do well every day of my life to succeed in my career. As you plan your growth, it will benefit you greatly to focus on growing in your areas of greatest strength, not your weaknesses, and grow in areas that will add value to you personally and professionally. 
put yourself in a growth environment. I've been told that certain species of fish will grow according to the size of their environment. Put them in a tiny aquarium and they remain small even at adulthood. Release them into a huge natural body of water and they grow to their intended size. People are similar. If they live in a harsh and limiting environment, they stay small. But put them someplace that encourages growth and they will expand to reach their potential. When I finished working through Kirk Campmeyer's materials, my appetite was whetted for more growth, and it was then that I determined to practice this discipline of growth. Every day I will grow on purpose with my plan. Margaret and I continued to do much of our growing together, but each of us also began tailoring our growth plans to our individual strengths and needs. One of the results of learning is that you realize how far you still need to go, and the more we learned, the hungrier we were for more growth. As you prepare to embrace the disciplines of growth, I want to encourage you to do the following. Make it your goal to grow in some way every day. In 1972, high school swimmer John Neighbor watched the Olympics on television and was inspired. He was already an excellent swimmer, but he began thinking about making the leap to become an Olympic-caliber athlete. He figured that he would have to lower his time by four seconds in four years. For you and me, that might not be too difficult because we have such a long way to go. But for someone like Neighbor, who was already well-trained, that seemed impossible. Elite racers think in terms of improving by fractions of a second. Thinking about that fact, he suddenly figured out how to approach the task. If he planned to train ten months a year for the next four years, he would have to improve by a tenth of a second every month. It was still a great challenge, but he believed he could do it and be ready for the 1976 Olympics. Neighbor had the right idea, and it worked. He came home with five medals, four of them gold. If you and I want to be successful in our growth, we must adopt a similar mindset. If we desire to improve a little every day and plan it that way, then we can make great progress over the long haul. Apply what you learn. Mike Abershoff, author of It's Your Ship, says, Up is not an easy direction. It defies gravity, both cultural and magnetic. Often the most difficult part of the upward climb of growth is putting into practice what you learn. Yet, that is where the true value is. The final test of any learning is always application. If what you're learning can be used in some way to help and improve you or others, then it is worth the effort. Of the Daily Dozen, I'd have to say that personal growth has probably been the strongest. I marvel at what has happened to me as my daily practice has compounded over the years. In my twenties, growth became the foundation of my lifelong learning. In my thirties, my growth began to separate me from my peers. In my forties, my growth became the source of my books and tapes. And in my fifties, my growth has taken me to higher levels than I thought possible. The greatest of all miracles is that we need not be tomorrow what we are today. The greatest of all insights is that we cannot be tomorrow what we do not do today. That is why today matters. One of my concerns when I began writing Today Matters was that the idea of trying to implement the Daily Dozen might seem overwhelming. I know it's impossible to tackle all twelve at the same time. It took me four decades to make the decisions and develop the disciplines in all twelve areas. So here are my suggestions concerning how to tackle the Daily Dozen and implement them into your life. Rate yourself on the Daily Dozen. Make a list of the Daily Dozen and rank how well you do them. Put a number one beside the one you do the best, a number two beside the one you do next best and so on until you have ranked your skill in them from 1 to 12. Verify your self-evaluation. Talk to a friend who knows you well and ask him or her to confirm how well you evaluated yourself. If your friend ranks your strengths and weaknesses differently, discuss your differences of opinion and make adjustments to the rankings as needed. 
pick two strengths. Pick two strengths from your top six to work on. Make sure that you have made the necessary decision for each area. Then begin practicing the daily disciplines in that area to make it a part of your life. Pick one weakness. Choose a weakness from your bottom six to work on. Again, make sure you have made the decision for that area and begin practicing the daily disciplines that go with it. Reevaluate. After 60 days have passed, reevaluate yourself in the three areas in which you've been working to improve. If you have made significant progress in an area, move on to something new. If an area still needs more work, remain focused on it for another 60 days. But don't work on more than three areas at a time and never work on more than one weakness at a time. Repeat. Keep working on areas until you have the entire daily dozen under your belt. Once you have made all the key decisions and each of the disciplines has become a habit in your life, then the daily dozen will be second nature to you. When these disciplines are woven into the fabric of your life, you will be able to make today your masterpiece. And when you do that, tomorrow will take care of itself. This has been a Time Warner Audiobooks production of Today Matters, 12 Daily Practices to Guarantee Tomorrow's Success, written by John Maxwell and read by the author. Executive Producer, Maya Thomas. Produced and directed by Louis Milgram. Text abridged by Karen DiMattia. Production supervised by Dennis Kao. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.